Chapter One of the Filigree Ball. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. The Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. Book One, The Forbidden Room, Chapter One the moor house are you speaking of the moor house for a detective whose talents had not been recognized at headquarters i possessed an ambition which fortunately for my standing with the lieutenant of the precinct had not yet been expressed in words though i had small reason for expecting great things of myself i had always cherished the hope that if a big case came my way i should be found able to do something with it something more that is than i had seen accomplished by the police of the district of columbia since i had had the honour of being one of their number therefore when i found myself plunged almost without my own volition into the jeffrey moore affair i believed that the opportunity had come whereby i might distinguish myself it had complications this jeffrey moore affair greater ones than the public ever knew keen as the interest in it ran both in and out of washington this is why i propose to tell the story of this great tragedy from my own standpoint even if in doing so i risk the charge of attempting to exploit my own connection with this celebrated case in this course i encountered as many disappointments as triumphs and brought out of the affair a heart as sore as it was satisfied for i am a lover of women and but i am keeping you from the story itself i was at the station-house the night uncle david came in he was always called uncle david even by the urchins who followed him in the street so i am showing him no disrespect gentleman though he is by giving him a title which as completely characterized him in those days as did his moody ways his quaint attire and the persistence with which he kept at his side his great mastiff rudge i had long since heard of the old gentleman as one of the most interesting residents of the precinct i had even seen him more than once on the avenue but i had never before been brought face to face with him and consequently had much too superficial a knowledge of his countenance to determine off-hand whether the uneasy light in his small grey eyes was natural to them or simply the result of a present excitement but when he began to talk i detected an unmistakable tremor in his tones and decided that he was in a state of suppressed agitation though he appeared to have nothing more alarming to impart than the fact that he had seen a light burning in some house presumably empty it was all so trivial that i gave him but scant attention till he let a name fall which caused me to prick up my ears and even put in a word the moor house he had said the moor house i repeated in amazement are you speaking of the moor house a thousand recollections came with the name what other he grumbled directing toward me a look as keen as it was impatient do you think that i would bother myself long about a house i had no interest in or drag a rutch from his warm rug to save some ungrateful neighbour from a possible burglary 
no it is my house which some rogue has chosen to enter that is he suavely corrected as he saw surprise in every eye the house which the law will give me if anything ever happens to that chit of a girl whom my brother left behind him growling some words at the dog who showed a decided inclination to lie down where he was the old man made for the door and in another moment would have been in the street if i had not stepped after him you are a moor and live in or near that old house i asked the surprise with which he met this question daunted me a little how long have you been in washington i should like to ask was his acrid retort oh some five months his good nature or what passed for such in this irascible old man returned in an instant and he curtly but not unkindly remarked you haven't learned much in that time then with a nod more ceremonious than many another man's bow he added with sudden dignity i am of the elder branch and live in the cottage fronting the old place i am the only resident on the block when you have lived here longer you will know why that especial neighbourhood is not a favourite one with those who cannot boast of the moor blood for the present let us attribute the bad name that it holds to malaria and with a significant hitch of his lean shoulders which set in undulating motion every fold of the old-fashioned cloak he wore he started again for the door but my curiosity was by this time roused to fever heat i knew more about this house than he gave me credit for no one who had read the papers of late much less a man connected with the police could help being well informed in all the details of its remarkable history what i had failed to know was his close relationship to the family whose name for the last two weeks had been in every mouth wait i called out you say that you live opposite to the moor house you can then tell me but he had no mind to stop for any gossip it was all in the papers he called back read them but first be sure to find out who has struck a light in the house that we all know has not even a caretaker in it it was good advice my duty and my curiosity both led me to follow it perhaps you have heard of the distinguishing feature of this house if so you do not need my explanations but if for any reason you are ignorant of the facts which within a very short time have set a final seal of horror upon this old historic dwelling then you will be glad to read what has made and will continue to make the moore house in washington one to be pointed at in daylight and shunned after dark not only by superstitious coloured folk but by all who are susceptible to the most ordinary emotions of fear and dread it was standing when washington was a village it antedates the capital and the white house built by a man of wealth it bears to this day the impress of the large ideas and quiet elegance of colonial times but the shadow which speedily fell across it made it a market-place even in those early days while it has always escaped the hackneyed epithet of haunted families that have moved in have as quickly moved out 
giving as their excuse that no happiness was to be found there and that sleep was impossible under its roof that there was some reason for this lack of rest within walls which were not without their tragic reminiscences all must acknowledge death had often occurred there and while this fact can be stated in regard to most old houses it is not often that one can say as in this case that it was invariably sudden and invariably of one character a lifeless man lying outstretched on a certain hearthstone might be found once in a house and awaken no special comment but when this same discovery has been made twice if not thrice during the history of a single dwelling one might surely be pardoned a distrust of its seemingly home-like appointments and discern in its slowly darkening walls the presence of an evil which if left to itself might perish in the natural decay of the place but which if met and challenged might strike again and make another blot on its thrice crimsoned hearthstone but these are old fables which i should hardly presume to mention had it not been for the recent occurrence which has recalled them to all men's minds and given to this long empty and slowly crumbling building an importance which has spread its fame from one end of the country to the other i refer to the tragedy attending the wedding lately celebrated there veronica moore rich pretty and wilful had long cherished a strange liking for this frowning old home of her ancestors and at the most critical time of her life conceived the idea of proving to herself and to society at large that no real ban lay upon it save in the imagination of the superstitious so being about to marry the choice of her young heart she caused this house to be opened for the wedding ceremony with what result you know though the occasion was a joyous one and accompanied by all that could give cheer to such a function it had not escaped the old-time shadow one of the guests staying into the room of ancient and unhallowed memory the one room which had not been thrown open to the crowd had been found within five minutes of the ceremony lying on its dolorous hearthstone dead and though the bride was spared a knowledge of the dreadful fact till the holy words were said a panic had seized the guests and emptied the house suddenly and completely as though the plague had been discovered there this is why i hastened to follow uncle david when he told me that all was not right in this house of tragic memories End of chapter one chapter two of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter two i enter though past seventy uncle david was a brisk walker and on this night in particular he sped along so fast that he was half way down h street by the time i had turned the corner at new hampshire avenue his gaunt but not ungraceful figure merged in that of the dog trotting closely at his heels 
was the only moving object in the dreary vista of this the most desolate block in washington as i neared the building i was so impressed by the surrounding stillness that i was ready to vow that the shadows were denser here than elsewhere and that the few gas lamps which flickered at intervals down the street shone with a more feeble ray than in any other equal length of street in washington meanwhile the shadow of uncle david had vanished from the pavement he had paused beside a fence which hung with vines surrounded and nearly hid from sight the little cottage he had mentioned as the only house on the block with the exception of the great moor place in other words his own home as i came abreast of him i heard him muttering not to his dog as was his custom but to himself in fact the dog was not to be seen and this desertion on the part of his constant companion seemed to add to his disturbance and affect him beyond all reason i could distinguish these words amongst the many he directed towards the unseen animal you're a knowing one too knowing you see that lucent shutter over the way as plainly as i do but you're a coward to slink away from it i don't i face the thing and what's more i'll show you yet what i think of a dog that can't stand his ground and help his old master out with some show of courage creaks does it well let it creak i don't mind its creaking glad as i should be to know whose hand hallo you've come have you this to me i had just stepped up to him yes i've come now what is the matter with the moor house he must have expected the question yet his answer was a long time coming his voice too sounded strained and was pitched quite too high to be natural but he evidently did not expect me to show surprise at his manner look at that window over there he cried at last that one with the slightly open shutter watch and you will see that shutter move there it creaked didn't you hear it a growl it was more like a moan came from the porch behind us instantly the old gentleman turned and with a gesture as fierce as it was instinctive shouted out be still there if you haven't the courage to face a blowing shutter keep your jaws shut and don't let every fellow who happens along know what a fool you are i declare he mourned it on half to himself and half to me that dog is getting old he can't be trusted any more he forsakes his master just when the rest was lost in his throat which rattled with something more than impatient anger meanwhile i had been attentively scrutinizing the house thus pointedly brought to my notice i had seen it many times before but as it happened had never stopped to look at it when the huge trees surrounding it were shrouded in darkness the black hollow of its disused portal looked out from shadows which acquired some of their sombreness from the tragic memories connected with its empty void its aspect was scarcely reassuring not that superstition lent its terrors to the lonely scene but that through the blank panes of the window alternately appearing and disappearing from view as the shutter pointed out by uncle david blew to and fro in the wind 
i saw or was persuaded that i saw a beam of light which argued an unknown presence within walls which had so lately been declared unfit for any man's habitation you are right i now remarked to the uneasy figure at my sight some one is prowling through the house yonder can it possibly be mrs jeffrey or her husband at night and with no gas in the house hardly the words were natural but the voice was not neither was his manner quite suited to the occasion giving him another sly glance and marking how uneasily he edged away from me in the darkness i cried out more cheerily than he possibly expected i will summon another officer and we three will just slip across and investigate not i was his violent rejoinder as he swung open a gate concealed in the vines behind him the jeffreys would resent my intrusion if they ever happened to hear of it indeed i laughed sounding my whistle then soberly enough for i was more than a little struck by the oddity of his behaviour and thought him as well worth of investigation as the house in which he showed such an interest you shouldn't let that count come and see what's up in the house you are so ready to call yours but he only drew farther into the shade i have no business over there he objected veronica and i have never been on good terms i was not even invited to her wedding though i live within a stone's throw of the door no i have done my duty in calling attention to that light and whether it's the bull's-eye of a burglar perhaps you don't know that there are rare treasures on the bookshelves of the great library or whether it is the fantastic illumination which frightens fool folks and some fool dogs i'm done with it and done with you too for to-night as he said this he mounted to his door and disappeared under the vines hanging like a shroud over the front of the house in another moment the rich peal of an organ sounded from within followed by the prolonged howling of rudge who either from a too keen appreciation of his master's music or in utter disapproval of it no one i believe has ever been able to make out which was accustomed to add his undesirable accompaniment to every strain from the old man's hand the playing did not cease because of these outrageous discords on the contrary it increased in force and volume causing rudge's expression of pain or pleasure to increase also the result can be imagined as i listened to the intolerable howls of the dog cutting clean through the exquisite harmonies of his master i wondered if the shadows cast by the frowning structure of the great moor house were alone to blame for uncle david's lack of neighbours meantime hibbert who was the first to hear my signal came running down the block as he joined me the light or what we chose to call a light appeared again in the window toward which my attention had been directed some one's in the moor house i declared in as matter-of-fact tones as i could command hibbert is a big fellow the biggest fellow on the force and so far as my own experience with him had gone as stolid and imperturbable as the best of us but after a quick glance at the towering walls of the lonely building he showed decided embarrassment and seemed in no haste to cross the street 
with difficulty i concealed my disgust come i cried stepping down from the curb let's go over and investigate the property is valuable the furnishings handsome and there is no end of costly books on the library shelves you have matches and a revolver he nodded quietly showing me first the one then the other then with a sheepish air which he endeavoured to carry off with a laugh he cried have you use for em if so i'm quite willing to part with them for half an hour i was more than amazed at this evidence of weakness in one i had always considered as tough and impenetrable as flint rock thrusting back the hand with which he had half drawn into view the weapon i had mentioned i put on my sternest sir and led the way across the street as i did so i tossed back the words we may come upon a gang you do not wish me to face some half dozen men alone you won't find any half dozen men there was his muttered reply nevertheless he followed me though with less spirit than i liked considering that my own manner was in a measure assumed and that i was not without sympathy well let me say for a dog who preferred howling a dismal accompaniment to his master's music to keeping open watch over a neighbourhood dominated by the unhallowed structure i now propose to enter the house is too well known for me to attempt a minute description of it the illustrations which have appeared in all the papers have already acquainted the general public with its simple facade and rows upon rows of shuttered windows even the great square porch with its bench for negro attendants has been photographed for the million those who have seen the picture in which the wedding guests are shown flying from its yawning doorways will not be especially interested in the quiet almost solemn aspect it presented as i passed up the low steps and laid my hand upon the knob of the old-fashioned front door not that i expected to win an entrance thereby but because it is my nature to approach everything in a common-sense way conceive then my astonishment when at the first touch the door yielded it was not even latched so so thought i this is no fool's job some one is in the house i had provided myself with an ordinary pocket lantern and when i had convinced hibbard that i fully meant to enter the house and discover for myself who had taken advantage of the popular prejudice against it to make a secret refuge or rendezvous of its decayed old rooms i took out this lantern and held it in readiness we may strike a hornet's nest i explained to hibbard whose feet seemed very heavy even for a man of his size but i'm going in and so are you only let me suggest that we first take off our shoes we can hide them in these bushes i always catch cold when i walk barefooted mumbled my brave companion but receiving no reply he drew off his shoes and dropped them beside mine in the cluster of stark bushes which figure so prominently in the illustrations that i have just mentioned then he took out his revolver and cocking it stood waiting while i gave a cautious push to the door darkness silence rather had i confronted a light and heard some noise 
even if it had been the ominous click to which we are so well accustomed hibbert seemed to share my feelings though from an entirely different cause pistols and lanterns are no good here he grumbled what we want at this blessed minute is a priest with a sprinkling of holy water and i for one he was actually sliding off with a smothered oath i drew him back see here i cried you're not a babe in arms come on or well what now he had clenched my arm and was pointing to the door which was slowly swaying to behind us notice that he whispered no key in the lock men use keys but my patience could stand no more with a shake i rid myself of his clutch muttering there go you're too much of a fool for me i'm in for it alone and in proof of my determination i turned the slide of the lantern and flashed the light through the house the effect was ghostly but while the fellow at my side breathed hard he did not take advantage of my words to make his escape as i half expected him to perhaps like myself he was fascinated by the dreary spectacle of long shadowy walls and an equally shadowy staircase emerging from a darkness which a minute before had seemed impenetrable perhaps he was simply ashamed at all events he stood his ground scrutinizing with rolling eyes that portion of the hall where two columns with gilded corinthian capitals marked the door of the room which no man entered without purpose or passed without dread doubtless he was thinking of that which had so frequently been carried out between these columns i know that i was and when in the sudden draught made by the open door some open draperies hanging near those columns blew out with a sudden swoop and shiver i was not at all astonished to see him lose what little courage had remained in him truth is i was startled myself but i was able to hide the fact and to whisper back to him fiercely don't be an idiot that curtain hides nothing worse than some sneaking political refugee or a gang of counterfeiters maybe i'd just like to put my hand on upson and hush i had just heard something for a moment we stood breathless but as the sound was not repeated i concluded that it was the creaking of that far away shutter certainly there was nothing moving near us shall we go upstairs whispered hibbert not till we have made sure that all is right down here a door stood slightly ajar on our left pushing it open we looked in a well-furnished parlour was before us here's where the wedding took place remarked hibbert straining his head over my shoulder there were signs of this wedding on every side walls and ceilings had been hung with garlands and these still clung to the mantelpiece and over and around the various doorways torn off branches and the remnants of old bouquets dropped from the hands of flying guests littered the carpet adding to the general confusion of overturned chairs and tables 
everywhere were evidences of the haste with which the place had been vacated as well as the superstitious dread which had prevented it being re-entered for the commonplace purpose of cleaning even the piano had not been shut and under it lay some scattered sheets of music which had been left where they fell to the probable loss of some poor musician the clock occupying the centre of the mantelpiece alone gave evidence of life it had been wound for the wedding and had not yet run down its tick-tick came faint enough however through the darkness as if it too had lost heart and would soon lapse into the deadly quiet of its ghostly surroundings it's funeral like chattered hibbard he was right i felt as if i were shutting the lid of a coffin when i finally closed the door our next steps took us into the rear where we found little to detain us and then with a certain dread fully justified by the event we made for the door defined by the two corinthian columns it was a jar like the rest and call me coward or call me fool i have called hibbert both you will remember i found that it cost me an effort to lay my hand on its mahogany panels danger if danger there was lurked here and while i had never known myself to quail before any ordinary antagonist i like others of my kind have no especial fondness for unseen and mysterious perils hibbert who up to this point had followed me almost too closely now accorded me all the room that was necessary it was with a sense of entering alone upon the scene that i finally thrust wide the door and crossed the threshold of this redoubtable room where but two short weeks before a fresh victim had been added to the list of those who had by some unheard of unimaginable means found their death within its recesses my first glance showed me little save the ponderous outlines of an old settle which jutted from the corner of the fireplace half way out into the room as it was seemingly from this seat that the men who at various times had been found lying here had fallen to their doom a thrill passed over me as i noted its unwieldy bulk and the deep shadow it threw on the ancient and dishonoured hearthstone to escape the ghastly memories it evoked and also to satisfy myself that the room was really as empty as it seemed i took another step forward this caused the light from the lantern i carried to spread beyond the point on which it had hitherto been so effectively concentrated but the result was to emphasize rather than detract from the extreme desolation of the great room the settle was a fixture as i afterwards found and was almost the only article of furniture to be seen on the wide expanse of uncarpeted floor there was a table or two in hiding somewhere amid the shadows at the other end from where i stood and possibly some kind of stool or settee but the general impression made upon me was that of a completely dismantled place given over to moth and rust i do not include the walls they were not bare like the floor 
but covered with books from floor to ceiling these books were not the books of to-day they had stood so long in their places unnoted and untouched that they had acquired the colour of fungus and smelt well there is no use adding to the picture every one knows the spirit of sickening desolation pervading rooms which have been shut up for an indefinite length of time from air and sunshine the elegance of the heavily stuccoed ceiling admitted to be one of the finest specimens of its kind in washington as well as the richness of the carvings ornamented the mantle of italian marble rising above the accursed hearthstone only served to make more evident the extreme neglect into which the rest of the room had sunk being anything but anxious to subject myself further to its unhappy influence and quite convinced that the place was indeed as empty as it looked i turned to leave when my eyes fell upon something so unexpected and so extraordinary seen as it was under the influence of the old tragedies with which my mind was necessarily full that i paused bulked in my advance and well-nigh uncertain whether i looked upon a real thing or on some strange and terrible fantasy of my aroused imagination a form lay before me outstretched on that portion of the floor which had hitherto been hidden from me by the half-open door a woman's form which even in that first casual look impressed itself upon me as one of aerial delicacy and extreme refinement and this form lay as only the dead lie the dead and i had been looking at the hearthstone for just such a picture no not just such a picture for this woman lay face uppermost and on the floor beside her was blood a hand had plucked my sleeve it was hibbert's startled by my immobility and silence he had stepped in with quaking members expecting he hardly knew what but no sooner did his eyes fall on the prostrate form which held me spellbound than an unforeseen change took place in him what had unnerved me restored him to his full self-possession death in this shape was familiar to him he had no fear of blood he did not show surprise at encountering it but only at the effect it appeared to produce on me shot was his laconic comment as he bent over the prostrate body shot through the heart she must have died before she fell shot that was a new experience for this room no wound had ever before disfigured those who had fallen here nor had any of the previous victims been found lying on any other spot than the one over which that huge settle kept guard as these thoughts crossed my mind i instinctively glanced again toward the fireplace for what i almost refused to believe outstretched at my feet when nothing more appeared there than that old seat of sinister memory i experienced a thrill which poorly prepared me for the cry which i now heard raised by hibbert look here what do you make of this he was pointing to what upon closer inspection proved to be a strip of white satin ribbon running from one of the delicate wrists of the girl before us to the handle of a pistol which had fallen not far away from her side it looks as if the pistol was attached to her that is something new in my experience what do you think it means 
alas there was but one thing it could mean the shot to which she had succumbed had been delivered by herself this fair and delicate creature was a suicide but suicide in this place how could we account for that had the story of this room's ill-acquired fame acted hypnotically on her or had she stumbled upon the open door in front and had been glad of any refuge where her misery might find a solitary termination closely scanning her upturned face i sought an answer to this question and while thus seeking received a fresh shock which i did not hesitate to communicate to my now none too sensitive companion look at these features i cried i seem to know them do you he growled out a dissent but stooped at my bidding and gave the pitiful young face a prolonged stare when he looked up again it was with a puzzled contraction of his eyebrows i've certainly seen it somewhere he hesitatingly admitted edging slowly away towards the door perhaps in the papers isn't she like like i interrupted it is veronica moore herself the owner of this house and she who was married here two weeks since to mr jeffrey evidently her reason was unseated by the tragedy which threw so deep a gloom over her wedding End of chapter two Chapter three of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter three. I remain. Not for an instant did I doubt the correctness of his identification. All the pictures I had seen of this well-known society belle had been marked by an individuality of expression which fixed her face in the memory and which i now saw repeated in the lifeless features before me greatly startled by the discovery but quite convinced that this was but the dreadful sequel of an already sufficiently dark tragedy i proceeded to take such steps as are common in these cases having sent the too willing hibbard to notify headquarters i was on the point of making a memorandum of such details as seemed important when my lantern suddenly went out leaving me in total darkness this was far from pleasant but the effect produced upon my mind was not without its result for no sooner did i find myself alone and in the unrelieved darkness of this grave-like room than i became convinced that no woman however frenzied would make her plunge into an unknown existence from the midst of a darkness only too suggestive of the tomb to which she was hastening it was not in nature not in a woman's nature at all events either she had committed the final act before such daylight as could filter through the shutters of this closed-up room had quite disappeared a hypothesis instantly destroyed by the warmth which still lingered in certain portions of her body or else the light which had been burning when she pulled the fatal trigger had since been carried elsewhere or extinguished recalling the uncertain gleams which we had seen flashing from one of the upper windows i was inclined to give some credence to the former theory but was disposed to be fair to both 
so after relighting my lamp i turned on one of the gas cocks of the massive chandelier over my head and applied a match the result was just what i had anticipated no gas in the pipes a metre had not been put in for the wedding this the papers had repeatedly stated in dwelling upon the garish effect of the daylight on the elaborate costumes worn by the ladies candles had not even been provided ah candles what then was it that i saw glittering on a small table at the other end of the room surely a candlestick or rather an old-fashioned candelabrum with a half-burnt candle in one of its sockets hastily crossing to it i felt of the candle wick it was quite stiff and hard but not considering this a satisfactory proof that it had not been lately burning the tip of a wick soon dries after the flame is blown out i took out my penknife and attacked the wick at what might be called its root whereupon i found that where the threads had been protected by the wax they were comparatively soft and penetrable the conclusion was obvious true to my instinct in this matter the woman had not lifted her weapon in darkness this candle had been burning but here my thoughts received a fresh shock if burning then by whom had it since been blown out not by her the wound was too fatally sure for that the steps taken between the table where the candelabrum stood and the place where she lay were taken if taken at all by her before that shot was fired some one else some one whose breath still lingered in the air about me had extinguished this candle flame after she fell and the death i looked down upon was not a suicide but a murder the excitement which this discovery caused to tingle through my every nerve had its birth in the ambitious feeling referred to in the opening paragraph of this narrative i believed that my long sought for opportunity had come that with the start given me by the conviction just stated i should be enabled to collect such clues and establish such facts as would lead to the acceptance of this new theory instead of the apparent one of suicide embraced by hibbard and about to be promulgated at police headquarters if so what a triumph would be mine and what a debt i should owe to the crabbed old gentleman whose seemingly fantastic fears had first drawn me to this place realizing the value of the opportunity afforded me by the few minutes i was likely to spend alone on this scene of crime i proceeded to my task with that directness and method which i had always promised myself should characterize my first success in detective work first then for another look at the fair young victim herself what a line of misery on the brow what dark hollows disfiguring the cheeks otherwise as delicate as the petals of a rose an interesting if not absolutely beautiful face it told me something i could hardly put into words so that it was like leaving a fascinating but unsolved mystery when i finally turned from it to study the hands each of which presented a separate problem that offered by the right wrist you already know the long white ribbon connecting it with the discharged pistol but the secret concealed by the left while less startling was perhaps fully as significant all the rings were gone 
even the wedding ring which had been placed there such a short time before had she been robbed there were no signs of violence visible nor even such disturbances as usually follow dispolitation by a criminal's hand the boa of delicate black net which encircled her neck rose fresh and intact to her chin nor did the heavy folds of her rich breadcloth gown betray that any disturbance had taken place in her figure after its fall if a jewel had flashed at her throat or earrings adorned her ears they had been removed by a careful if not a loving hand but i was rather inclined to think that she had entered upon the scene of her death without ornaments such severe simplicity marked her whole attire her hat which was as plain and also as elegant as the rest of her clothing lay near her on the floor it had been taken off and thrown down manifestly by an impatient hand that this hand was her own was evident from a small but very significant fact the pin which had held it to her hair had been thrust again into the hat no hand but hers would have taken this precaution a man would have flung it aside just as he would have flung the hat Question. did this argue a natural expectation on her part of resuming her hat or was the action the result of an unconscious habit having thus noted all that was possible concerning her without infringing on the rights of the coroner i next proceeded to cast about for clues to the identity of the person whom i considered responsible for the extinguished candle but here a great disappointment awaited me i could find nothing expressive of a second person's presence save a pile of cigar ashes scattered near the legs of a common kitchen chair which stood face to face with the bookshelves in that part of the room where the candelabrum rested on a small table but these ashes looked old nor could i detect any evidence of tobacco smoke in the general mustiness pervading the place was the man who died here a fortnight since accountable for these ashes if so his unfinished cigar must be within sight should i search for it no for this would take me to the hearth and that was quite too deadly a place to be heedlessly approached besides i was not yet finished with the spot where i then stood if i could gather nothing satisfactory from the ashes perhaps i could from the chair or the shelves before which it had been placed some one with an interest in books had sat there some one who expected to spend sufficient time over those old tomes to feel the need of a chair had this interest been a general one or had it centred in a particular volume i ran my eye over the shelves within reach possibly with an idea of settling this question and though my knowledge of books is limited i could see that these were what one might call rarities some of them contained specimens of black letter all mouldy and smothered in dust in others i saw dates of publication which placed them among volumes dear to a collector's heart but none of them so far as i could see gave any evidence of having been lately handled and anxious to waste no time on puerile details i hastily quitted my chair and was proceeding to turn my attention elsewhere when i noticed on an upper shelf a book projecting slightly beyond the others instantly my foot was on the chair and the book in my hand 
did i find it of interest yes but not on account of its contents for they were pure greek to me but because it lacked the dust on its upper edge which had marked every other volume i had handled this then was what had attracted the unknown to these shelves this let me see if i can remember its title disquisition upon old coast lines pshaw i was wasting my time what had such a dry companion as this to do with the body lying in its blood a few steps behind me or with the hand which had put out the candle upon this dreadful deed nothing i replaced the book but not so hastily as to push it one inch beyond the position in which i found it for if it had a tale to tell then was it my business to leave that tale to be read by those who understood books better than i did my next move was towards the little table holding the candelabrum with the glittering pendants this table was one of a nest standing against a near-by wall investigation proved that it had been lifted from the others and brought to its present position within a very short space of time for the dust lying thick on its top was almost entirely lacking from the one which had been nested under it neither had the candelabrum been standing there long dust being found under as well as around it had her hand brought it there hardly if it came from the top of the mantel toward which i now turned my course of investigation i have already mentioned this mantel more than once this i could hardly avoid since in and about it lay the heart of the mystery for which the room was remarkable but though i have thus freely spoken of it and though it was not absent from my thoughts for a moment i had not ventured to approach it beyond a certain safe radius now in looking to see if i might lessen this radius i experienced that sudden and overwhelming interest in its every feature which attaches to all objects peculiarly associated with danger i even took a step toward it holding up my lamp so that a stray ray struck the faded surface of an old engraving hanging over the fireplace it was the well-known one in washington at least of benjamin franklin at the court of france interesting no doubt in a general way but scarcely calculated to hold the eye at so critical an instant neither did the shelf below call for more than momentary attention for it was absolutely bare so was the time-worn if not blood-stained hearth save for the impenetrable shadow cast over it by the huge bulk of the great settle standing at its edge i have already described the impression made on me at my first entrance by this ancient and characteristic article of furniture it was intensified now as my eye ran over the clumsy carving which added to the discomfort of its high straight back and as i smelt the smell of its mouldy and possibly mouse-haunted cushions a crawling sense of dread took the place of my first instinctive repugnance not because superstition had as yet laid its grip upon me although the place the hour and the near and veritable presence of death were enough to rouse the imagination past the bounds of the actual but because of a discovery i had made 
a discovery which emphasized the tradition that all who had been found dead under the mantle had fallen as if from the end of this monstrous and patriarchal bench do you ask what this discovery was it can be told in a word this one end and only this end had been made comfortable for the sitter for a space scarcely wide enough for one the seat and back of this special point had been upholstered with leather fastened to the wood with heavy wrought nails the remaining portion stretched out bare hard and inexpressibly forbidding to one who sought ease there or even a moment of casual rest the natural interference was that the owner of this quaint piece of furniture had been a very selfish man who thought only of his own comfort but might he not have had some other reason for this apparent niggardliness as i asked myself this question and noted how the long and embracing arm which guarded this cushioned retreat was flattened on top for the convenient holding of decanter and glass feelings to which i can give no name and which i had fondly believed myself proof against began to take the place of judgment and reason before i realized the nature of my own impulse or to what it was driving me i found myself moving slowly and steadily toward this formidable seat under an irresistible desire to fling myself down upon these old cushions and but here the creaking of some far-off shutter possibly the one i had seen swaying from the opposite side of the street recalled me to the duties of the hour and remembering that my investigations were but half completed and that i might be interrupted at any moment by detectives from headquarters i broke from the accursed charm which horrified me the moment i escaped it and quitting the room by a door at the farther end sought to find in some of the adjacent rooms the definite traces i had failed to discover on this the actual scene of the crime it was a dismal search revealing at every turn the almost maddened haste with which the house had been abandoned the dining-room especially roused feelings which were far from pleasant the table evidently set for the wedding breakfast had been denuded in such breathless hurry that the food had been tossed from the dishes and now lay in mouldering heaps on the floor the wedding cake which some one had dropped possibly in the effort to save it had been stepped on and broken glass crumpled napery and withered flowers made all the corners unsightly and rendered stepping over the unwholesome floors at once disgusting and dangerous the pantries opening out of this room were in no better case shrinking from the sights and smells i found here i passed out into the kitchen and so on by a close and narrow passage to the negro quarters clustered in the rear here i made a discovery one of the windows in this long disused portion of the house was not only unlocked but partly open but as i came upon no marks showing that this outlet had been used by the escaping murderer i made my way back to the front of the house and thus to the stairs communicating with the upper floor it was on the rug lying at the foot of these stairs that i came upon the first of a dozen or more burnt matches which lay in a distinct trail up the staircase and along the floors of the upper halls 
as these matches were all burned as short as fingers could hold them it was evident that they had been used to light the steps of some one seeking refuge above possibly in the very room where we had seen the light which had first drawn us to this house how then should i proceed or await the coming of the boys before pushing in upon a possible murderer i decided to proceed fascinated i think by the nicety of the trail which lay before me but when after a careful following in the steps of him who had so lately preceded me i came upon a tightly closed door at the end of a side passage i own that i stopped a moment before lifting hand to it so much may lie beyond a tightly closed door but my hesitation if hesitation it was lasted but a moment my natural impatience and the promptings of my vanity overcame the dictates of my judgment and reckless of consequences perhaps disdainful of them i soon had the knob in my grasp i gave a slight push to the door and on seeing a crack of light leap into life along the jam pushed the door wider and wider till the whole room stood revealed the instantaneous banging of a shutter in one of its windows proved the room to be the very one which we had seen lighted from below otherwise all was still nor was i able to detect in my first hurried glance any other token of human presence than a candle sputtering in its own grease at the bottom of a tumbler placed on one corner of an old-fashioned dressing-table this the one touch of incongruity in a room otherwise rich if not stately in its appointments was loud in its suggestion of some hidden presence given to expedience and reckless of consequences but of this presence nothing was to be seen not satisfied with this short survey a survey which had given me the impression of a spacious old-fashioned chamber fully furnished but breathing of the bygone rather than of the present and resolved to know the worst or rather to dare the worst and be done with it i strode straight into the centre of the room and cast about me quickly a comprehensive glance which spared nothing not even the shadows lurking in the corners but no low-lying figure started up from those corners nor did any crouching head rise into sight from beyond the leaves of the big screen behind which i was careful to look greatly reassured and indeed quite convinced that wherever the criminal lurked at that moment he was not in the same room with me i turned my attention to my surroundings which had many points of interest foremost among these was the big four-poster which occupied a large space at my right i had never seen its like in use before and i was greatly attracted by its size and the air of mystery imparted to it by its closely drawn curtains of faded brocade in fact this bed whether from its appearance or some occult influence inherent in it had a fascination for me i hesitated to approach it yet could not forbear surveying it long and earnestly could it be possible that those curtains concealed some one in hiding behind them strange to say i did not feel quite ready to lay hand on them and see a dressing-table laden with woman's fixings and various articles of the toilet all of an unexpected value and richness occupied the space between the two windows and on the floor 
immediately in front of a high mahogany mantel there lay amid a number of empty boxes an overturned chair this chair and the conjectures its position awakened led me to look up at the mantel with which it seemed to be in some way connected and thus i became aware of a one old drawing hanging on the wall above it why this picture which was a totally uninteresting sketch of a simpering girl face should have held my eye after the first glance i cannot say even now it had no beauty even of the sentimental kind and very little if any meaning its lines weak at the best were nearly obliterated and in some places quite faded out yet i not only paused to look at it but in looking at it forgot myself and well nigh my errand yet there was no apparent reason for the spell it exerted over me nor could i account in any way for the really superstitious dread which from this moment seized me making my head move slowly around with shrinking backward looks as that swaying shutter creaked or some of the fitful noises which grow out of silence in answer to our inner expectancy drew my attention or appalled my sense to all appearance there was less here than below to affect a man's courage no inanimate body with the mark of the slayer upon it lent horror to these walls yet sensations which i had easily overcome in the library below clung with strange insistence to me here making it an effort for me to move and giving to the unexpected reflection of my own image in the mirror i chanced to pass a power to shock my nerves which has never been repeated in my experience it may seem both unnecessary and out of character for a man of my calling to acknowledge these chance sensations but only by doing so can i account for the minutes which elapsed before i summoned sufficient self-possession to draw aside the closed curtains of the bed and take the quick look inside which my present doubtful position demanded but once i had broken the spell and taken the look just mentioned i found my manhood return and with it my old ardour for clues the bed held no gaping chattering criminal yet was it not quite empty something lay there and this something while commonplace in itself was enough out of keeping with the place and the hour to rouse my interest and awaken my conjectures it was a lady's wrap so rich in quality and of such a festive appearance that it was astonishing to find it lying in a neglected state in this crumbling old house though i know little of the cost of women's garments i do know the value of lace and this garment was covered with it interesting as was this find it was followed by one still more so nestled in the folds of the cloak lay the withered remains of what could only have been the bridal bouquet unsightly now and scentless it was once a beautiful specimen of the florist's art as i noted how the main bunch of roses and lilies was connected by long satin ribbons to the lesser clusters which hung from it i recalled with conceivable horror the use to which a similar ribbon had been put in the room below in the shudder called up by this coincidence i forgot to speculate how a bouquet carried by the bride could have found its way back to this upstairs room when 
as all accounts agree she had fled from the parlour below without speaking or staying foot the moment she was told of the catastrophe which had taken place in the library that her wrap should be lying here was not strange but that the wedding bouquet that it really was the wedding bouquet and that this was the room in which the bride had dressed for the ceremony was apparent to the most casual observer but it became an established fact when in my further course about the room i chanced on a handkerchief with the name veronica embroidered in one corner this handkerchief had an interest apart from the name on it it was of dainty texture and quite in keeping so far as value went with the other belongings of its fastidious owner but it was not clean indeed it was strangely soiled and this soil was of a nature i did not readily understand a woman would doubtless have comprehended immediately the cause of the brown streaks i found on it but it took me several minutes to realize that this bit of cambric delicate as a cobweb had been used to remove dust to remove dust dust from what from the mantel-shelf probably upon one end of which i found it but no one look along the polished boards convinced me that whatever else had been dusted in this room this shelf had not the accumulation of days if not of months was visible from one end to the other of its unrelieved surface where the handkerchief had lain and the greatest discovery yet where five clear spots just to the left of the centre showed me where some man's finger-tips had rested nothing but the presence of finger-tips could have caused just the appearance presented by these spots by scrutinizing them closely i could even tell where the thumb had rested and at once foresaw the possibility of determining by means of these marks both the size and shape of the hand which had left behind it so neat and unmistakable a clue wonderful but what did it all mean why should a man rest his finger-tips on this out-of-the-way shelf had he done so in an effort to balance himself for a look up the chimney no for then the marks made by his fingers would have extended to the edge of the shelf whereas these were in the middle of it their shape too was round not oblong hence the pressure had come from above and ah i had it these impressions in the dust of the shelf were just such as would be made by a person steadying himself for a close look at the old picture and this accounted also for the overturned chair and for the handkerchief used as a duster some one's interest in this picture had been greater than mine some one who was either very near-sighted or whose temperament was such that only the closest inspection would satisfy an aroused curiosity this gave me an idea or rather impressed upon me the necessity of preserving the outline of these tell-tale marks while they were still plain to the eye taking out my pen-knife i lightly ran the point of my sharpest blade around each separate impression till i had fixed them for all time in the well-worn varnish of the mahogany this done my thoughts recurred to the question already raised what was it there in this old picture to arouse such curiosity in one bent on evil if not fresh from hideous crime 
i have said before that the picture as a picture was worthless a mere faded sketch fit only for lumbering up some old garret then wherein lay its charm a charm which i myself had felt though not to this extent it was useless to conjecture a fresh difficulty had been added to my task by this puzzling discovery but difficulties only increased my interest it was with an odd feeling of elation that in a further examination of this room i came upon two additional facts equally odd and irreconcilable one was the presence of a pen-knife with the file-blade open on a small table under the window marked by the loosened shutter scattered about it were some filings which shone as the light from my lantern fell upon them but which were so fine as to call for a magnifying glass to make them out the other was in connection with a closet not far from the great bed it was an empty closet so far as the hooks went and the two great drawers which i found standing half open at its back but in the middle of the floor lay an overturned candelabrum similar to the one below but with its prisms scattered and its one candle crushed and battered out of all shape on the blackened boards if upset while alight the foot which had stamped upon it in a wild endeavour to put out the flames had been a frenzied one now by whom had this frenzy been shown and when within the hour i could detect no smell of smoke at some former time then say on the day of the bridal glancing from the broken candle at my feet to the one giving its last sputter in the tumbler on the dressing-table i owned myself perplexed surely no ordinary explanation fitted these extraordinary and seemingly contradictory circumstances End of chapter 3four of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter four signed veronica i am in some ways hypersensitive among my other weaknesses i have a wholesome dread of ridicule and this is probably why i failed to press my theory on the captain when he appeared and even forbore to mention the various small matters which had so attracted my attention if he and the experienced men who came with him saw suicide and nothing but suicide in this lamentable shooting of a bride of two weeks then it was not for me to suggest a deeper crime especially as one of the latter eyed me with open scorn when i proposed to accompany them upstairs into the room where the light had been seen burning no i would keep my discovery to myself or at least forbear to mention them till i found the captain alone asking nothing at this juncture but permission to remain in the house till mr jeffrey arrived i had been told that an officer had gone for this gentleman and when i heard the sound of wheels in front i made a rush for the door in my anxiety to catch a glimpse of him but it was a woman who alighted as this woman was in a state of great agitation one of the men hastened down to offer his arm as she took it i asked hibbard who had suddenly reappeared upon the scene who she was he said that she was probably the sister of the woman who lay inside 
upon which i remembered that this lady under the name of miss tuttle she was but half-sister to miss moore had been repeatedly mentioned by the reporters in the account of the wedding before mentioned as a person of superior attainments and magnificent beauty this did not take from my interest and flinging decorum to the winds i approached her as near as possible to the threshold which she must soon cross as i did so i was astonished to hear the strains of uncle david's organ still pealing from the opposite side of the way this at a moment so serious and while matters of apparent consequence were taking place in the house to which he had himself directed the attention of the police struck me as carrying stoicism to the extreme not very favourably impressed by this display of open if not insulting indifference on the part of the sole remaining moor an indifference which did not appear quite natural even in a man of his morbid eccentricity i resolved to know more of this old man and above all to make myself fully acquainted with the exact relations which had existed between him and his unhappy niece meanwhile miss tuttle had stepped within the circle of light cast by our lanterns i have never seen a finer woman nor one whose features displayed a more heart-rendering emotion this called for respect and i for one endeavoured to show it by withdrawing into the background but i soon stepped forward again my desire to understand her was too great the impression made by her bearing too complex to be passed over lightly by one on the lookout for a key to the remarkable tragedy before us meanwhile her lips had opened with the cry my sister where is my sister the captain made a hurried movement towards the rear and then with the laudable intention doubtless of preparing her for the ghastly sight which awaited her returned and opened a way for her into the drawing-room but she was not to be turned aside from her course passing him by she made directly for the library which she entered with a bound struck by her daring we all crowded up behind her and curious brutes that we were grouped ourselves in a semicircle about the doorway as she faltered towards her sister's outstretched form and fell on her knees beside it her involuntary shriek and the fierce recoil she made as her eyes fell on the long white ribbon trailing over the floor from her sister's wrist struck me as voicing the utmost horror of which the human soul is capable it was as though her very soul were pierced something in the fact itself something in the appearance of this snowy ribbon tied to the scarce whiter wrist seemed to pluck at the very root of her being and when her glance in travelling its length lighted on the death-dealing weapon at its end she cringed in such apparent anguish that we looked to see her fall in a swoon or break out into delirium we were correspondingly startled when she suddenly burst forth with this word of stern command untie that knot why do you leave that dreadful thing fast to her untie it i say it is killing me i cannot bear the sight and from trembling she passed to shuddering till her whole body shook convulsively 
the captain with much consideration drew back the hand he had impulsively stretched toward the ribbon no no he protested we cannot do that we can do nothing till the coroner comes it is necessary that he should see her just as she was found besides mr jeffrey has a right to the same privilege we expect him any moment the beautiful head of the woman before us shook involuntarily but her lips made no protest i doubt if she possessed the power of speech at that moment a change subtle but quite perceptible had taken place in her emotions at mention of her sister's husband and though she exerted herself to remain calm the effort seemed too much for her strength anxious to hide this evidence of weakness she rose impetuously and then we saw how tall she was how the long lines of her cloak became her and what a glorious creature she was altogether it will kill him she groaned in a deep inward voice then with a certain forced haste and in a tone of surprise which to my ear had not quite a natural ring she called aloud on her who could no longer either listen or answer oh veronica veronica what cause had you for death and why do we find you lying here in a spot you so feared and detested don't you know insinuated the captain with a mild persuasiveness such as he was seldom heard to use do you mean that you cannot account for your sister's violent end you who have lived with her or so i have been told ever since her marriage with mr jeffrey yes keen and clear the word rang out fierce in its keenness and almost too clear to be in keeping with the half-choked tones with which she added i know that she was not happy that she never has been happy since the shadow which this room suggests fell upon her marriage but how could i so much as dream that her dread of the past or her fear of the future would drive her to suicide and in this place of all places had i done so had i imagined in the least degree that she was affected to this extent do you think that i would have left her for one instant alone none of us knew that she contemplated death she had no appearance of it she laughed when i what had she been about to say the captain seemed to wonder and after waiting in vain for the completion of her sentence he quietly suggested you have not finished what you had to say miss tuttle she started and seemed to come back from some remote region of thought into which she had wandered i don't know i forget she stammered with a heart-broken sigh poor veronica wretched veronica how shall i ever tell him how how can we ever prepare him the captain took advantage of this reference to mr jeffrey to ask where that gentleman was the young lady did not seem eager to reply but when pressed answered though somewhat mechanically that it was impossible for her to say mr jeffrey had many friends with any one of whom he might be enjoying a social evening but it is far past midnight now remarked the captain is he in the habit of remaining out late sometimes she faintly admitted two or three times since his marriage he has been out till one were there other causes for the young bride's evident disappointment and misery besides the one intimated there certainly was some excuse for thinking so 
possibly some one of us may have shown his doubts in this regard for the woman before us suddenly broke forth with this vehement assertion mr jeffrey was a loving husband to my sister a very loving husband she emphasized then growing desperately pale she added i have never known a better man and stopped some hidden anguish in this cry some self-consciousness in this pause suggested to me a possibility which i was glad to see ignored by the captain in his next question when did you see your sister last he asked were you at home when she left her husband's house alas she murmured then seeing that a more direct answer was expected of her she added with as little appearance of effort as possible i was at home and i heard her go but i had no idea that it was for any purpose other than to join some social gathering dressed this way the captain pointed to the floor and her eyes followed certainly mrs jeffrey was not apparelled for an evening company as miss tuttle realized the trap into which she had been betrayed her words rushed forth and tripped each other up i did not notice she often wore black it became her my sister was eccentric worse worse than useless some slips cannot be explained away miss tuttle seemed to realize that this was one of them for she paused abruptly with the words half finished on her tongue yet her attitude commanded respect and i for one was ready to accord it to her certainly such a woman was not to be seen every day and if her replies lacked candour there was a nobility in her presence which gave the lie to any doubt at least that was the effect she produced on me whether or not her interrogator shared my feeling i could not so readily determine for his attention as well as mine was suddenly diverted by the cry which now escaped her lips her watch where's her watch it is gone i saw it on her breast and it's gone it hung just just where wait cried one of the men who had been peering about the floor is this it he held aloft a small object blazing with jewels yes she gasped trying to take it but the officer gave it to the captain instead it must have slipped from her as she fell remarked the letter after a cursory examination of the glittering trinket the pin by which she attached it to her dress must have been insecurely fastened then quickly and with a sharp look at miss tuttle do you know if this was considered an accurate timepiece yes why do you ask is it look he held it up with the face toward us the hands stood at thirteen minutes past seven the hour and the moment when it struck the floor he declared and consequently the hour and the moment when mrs jeffrey fell finished durbin miss tuttle said nothing only gasped valuable evidence quoth the captain putting the watch in his pocket then with a kind look at her called forth by the sight of her misery does this hour agree with the time of her leaving the house i cannot say i think so it was some time before or after seven i don't remember the exact minute it would take fifteen for her to walk here did she walk i do not know i didn't see her leave my room is at the back of the house you can say if she left alone or in the company of her husband 
mr jeffrey was not with her was mr jeffrey in the house he was not the last negative was faintly spoken the captain noticed this and ventured upon interrogating her further how long had he been gone her lips parted she was deeply agitated but when she spoke it was coldly and with studied precision mr jeffrey was not at home to-night at all he has not been in all day not at home did his wife know that he was going to dine out she said nothing about it the captain cut short his questions and in another moment i understood why a gentleman was standing in the doorway whose face once seen was enough to stop the words on any man's lips miss tuttle saw this gentleman almost as quickly as we did and sank with an involuntary moan to her knees it was francis jeffrey come to look upon his dead bride i have been present at many tragic scenes and have beheld men under almost every aspect of grief terror and remorse but there was something in the face of this man at this dreadful moment that was quite new to me and as i judge equally new to the other hardy officials about me to be sure he was a gentleman and a very high-bred one at that and it is but seldom we have to do with any of his ilk breathlessly we awaited his first words not that he showed frenzy or made any display of the grief or surprise natural to the occasion on the contrary he was the quietest person present and among all the emotions his white face mirrored i saw no signs of what might be called sorrow yet his appearance was one to wring the heart and rouse the most contradictory conjectures as to just what caught in his evidently highly strung nature throbbed most acutely to the horror and astonishment of this appalling end of so short a married life his eye which was fixed on the prostrate body of his bride did not yield up its secret when he moved and came to where she lay and caught his first sight of the ribbon and the pistol attached to it the most experienced among us were baffled as to the nature of his feelings and thoughts one thing alone was patent to all he had no wish to touch this woman whom he had so lately sworn to cherish his eyes devoured her he shuddered and strove several times to speak and though kneeling by her side he did not reach forth his hand nor did he let a tear fall on the appealing features so pathetically turned upwards as if to meet his look suddenly he leapt to his feet must she stay here he demanded looking about for the person most in authority the captain answered by a question how do you account for her being here at all what explanation have you as her husband to give for this strange suicide of your wife for reply mr jeffrey who was an exceptionally handsome man drew forth a small slip of crumpled paper which he immediately handed over to the speaker let her words explain said he i found this scrap of writing in our upstairs room when i returned home to-night she must have written it just before before a smothered groan filled up the break 
but it did not come from his lips which were fixed and set but from those of the woman who crouched among us did he catch this expression of sorrow from one whose presence he as yet had given no token of recognizing he did not seem to his eye was on the captain who was slowly reading by the light of a lantern held in a detective's hand the almost illegible words which mr jeffrey had just said were his wife's last communication will they seem as pathetic to the eye as they did to the ear in that room of awesome memories and present death i find that i do not love you as i thought i did i cannot live knowing this to be so i pray god that you may forgive me veronica a gasp from the figure in the corner then silence we were glad to hear the captain's voice again a woman's heart is a great mystery he remarked with a short glance at mr jeffrey it was a sentiment we could all echo for he to whom she had alluded in these few lines as the one she should not love was a man whom most women would consider the embodiment of all that was admirable and attractive that one woman so regarded him was apparent to all if ever the heart spoke in a human face it spoke in that of miss tuttle as she watched her sister's husband struggling for composure above the prostrate form of her who but a few hours previous had been the envy of all the fashionable young women in washington i found it hard to fix my attention on the next question interesting and valuable as every small detail was likely to prove in case my theory of this crime should ever come to be looked on as the true one how came you to search here for the wife who had written you this vague and far from satisfactory farewell i see no hint in these lines of the place where she intended to take her life no no even this strong man shrank from this idea and showed a very natural recoil as his glances flew about the ill-omened room and finally rested on the fireside over which so repellent a mystery hung in impenetrable shadow she said nothing of her intentions nothing but the man who came for me told me where she was to be found he was waiting at the door of my house he had been on a search for me up and down the town we met on the stoop the captain accepted this explanation without cavil i was glad he did but to me the affair showed inconsistencies which i secretly felt it to be my especial duty to unravel End of chapter four chapter five of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter v master and dog no further opportunity was afforded me that night for studying the three leading characters in the remarkable drama i saw unfolding before me a task was assigned me by the captain which took me from the house and i missed the next scene the arrival of the coroner but i repaid myself for this loss in a way i thought justified by the importance of my own theory and the evident necessity there was of collecting each and every point of evidence which could give colouring to the charge 
in the event of this crime coming to be looked on at headquarters as one of murder observing that light was still burning in uncle david's domicile i crossed to his door and rang the bell i was answered by the deep and prolonged howl of a dog soon cut short by his master's amiable greeting the letter was a surprise to me i had heard so often of mr moore's churlishness as a host that i had expected some rebuff but i encountered no such tokens of hostility his brow was smooth and his smile cheerfully condescending indeed he appeared anxious to have me enter and cast an indulgent look at rudge whose impressive joy at this break in the monotony of his existence was tinged with a very evident dread of offending his master interested anew i followed this man of contradictory impulses into the room toward which he led me the time has now come for a more careful description of this peculiar man mr moore was tall and of that refined spareness of shape which suggests the scholar yet he had not the scholar's eye on the contrary his regard was quick if not alert and while it did not convey actual malice or ill-will it roused in the spectator an uncomfortable feeling not altogether easy to analyse he wore his iron-grey locks quite long and to his distinguishing idiosyncrasy as well as to his invariable custom of taking his dog with him wherever he went was due the interest always shown in him by street urchins on account of his whimsicalities he had acquired the epithet of uncle david among them despite his aristocratic connections and his gentlemanlike bearing his clothes formed no exception to the general air of individuality which marked him they were of different cut from those of other men and in this as in many other ways he was a law to himself notably so in the following instance he kept one day of the year religiously and kept it always in the same way long years before he had been blessed with a wife who both understood and loved him he had never forgotten this fact and once a year presumably on the anniversary of her death it was his custom to go to the cemetery where she lay and to spend the whole day under the shadow of the stone he had raised to her memory no matter what the weather no matter what the condition of his own health he was always to be seen in this spot at the hour of seven leaning against the shaft on which his wife's name was written eating his supper in the company of his dog it was a custom he had never omitted so well known was it to the boys and certain other curious individuals in the neighbourhood that he never lacked an audience though woe betide the daring foot that presumed to invade the precincts of the lot he called his or the venturesome voice which offered to raise itself in gibe or jeer he had but to cast a glance at rudge and an avenging rush scattered the crowd in a twinkling but he seldom had occasion to resort to this extreme measure for preserving the peace and quiet of his solemn watch as a rule he was allowed to eat his meal undisturbed and to pass out unmolested even by ridicule 
though his teeth might still be busy over some final tidbit often the great tears might be seen hanging undried upon his withered cheeks so much for one oddity which may stand as a sample of many others one glance at the room into which he ushered me showed why he cherished so marked a dislike for visitors it was bare to the point of discomfort and had it not been for a certain quaintness in the shape of the few articles to be seen there i should have experienced a decided feeling of repulsion so pronounced was this contrast between this poverty-stricken interior and the polished bearing of its owner he i am sure could have shown no more elevated manners if he had been doing the honours of a palace the organ with the marks of home construction upon it was the only object visible which spoke of luxury or even comfort but enough of these possibly uninteresting details i did not dwell on them myself except in a vague way and while waiting for him to open the conversation this he did as soon as he saw that i had no intention of speaking first and did you find any one in the old house he asked keeping him well under my eye i replied with intentional brusqueness she has gone there once too often the stare he gave me was that of an actor who feels that some expression of surprise is expected of him she he repeated whom can you possibly mean by she the surprise i expressed at this bold attempt at ingenuousness was better simulated than his i hope you don't know i exclaimed can you live directly opposite a place of such remarkable associations and not interest yourself in who goes in and out of its deserted doors i don't sit in my front window he peevishly returned i let my eye roam toward a chair standing suspiciously near the very window he had designated but you saw the light i saw that from the doorstep when i went out to give rudge his usual five minutes breathing spell on the stoop but you have not answered my question whom do you mean by she veronica jeffrey i replied she who was veronica moore she has visited this haunted house of hers for the last time last time either he could not or would not understand me what has happened to my niece he cried rising with an energy that displaced the great dog and sent him with hanging head and trailing tail to his own special sleeping-place under the table has she run upon a ghost in those dismal apartments you interest me greatly i did not think she would ever have the pluck to visit this house again after what happened at her wedding she has had the pluck i assured him and what is more she has had enough of it not only to re-enter the house but to re-enter it alone at least such is the present inference had you been blessed with more curiosity and made more frequent use of the chair so conveniently placed for viewing the opposite house you might have been in a position to correct this inference it would help the police materially to know positively that she had no companion in her fatal visit fatal he repeated running his finger inside his neckband which suddenly seemed to have grown too tight for comfort 
can it be that my niece has been frightened to death in that old place you alarm me he did not look alarmed but then he was not of an impressible nature yet he was of the same human clay as the rest of us and if he knew no more of this occurrence than he tried to make out could not be altogether impervious to what i had to say next you have a right to be alarmed i assented she was not frightened to death yet she is lying dead on the library floor then with a glance at the windows about me i added lightly i take it that a pistol shot delivered over there could not be heard in this room he sank rather melodramatically into his seat yet his face and form did not lose that sudden assumption of dignity which i had observed in him ever since my entrance into the house i am overwhelmed by this news he remarked she has shot herself why i did not say that she had shot herself i carefully repeated yet the facts point that way and mr jeffrey accepts the suicide theory without question ah mr jeffrey is there most certainly he was sent for at once and miss tuttle she came with him of course she came but not with him she is very fond of her sister i must go over at once he cried leaping again to his feet and looking about for his hat it is my duty to make them feel at home in short to to put the house at their disposal here he found his hat and placed it on his head the property is mine now you know he politely explained turning with a keen light in his grey eye full upon me and overwhelming me with the grand air of a man who has come unexpectedly into his own mrs jeffrey's father was my younger brother the story is an old and long one and the property which in all justice should have been divided between us went entirely to him but he was a good fellow in the main and saw the injustice of his father's will as clearly as i did and years ago made one on his own account bequeathing me the whole estate in case he left no issue or that issue died veronica was his only child veronica has died therefore the old house is mine and all that goes with it all that goes with it there was the miser's gloating in this repetition of a phrase sufficiently expressive in itself or rather the gloating of a man who sees himself suddenly rich after a life of poverty there was likewise a callousness as regarded his niece's surprising death which i considered myself to have some excuse for noticing you accept her death very calmly i remarked probably you knew her to be possessed of an erratic mind he was about to bestow an admonitory kick on his dog who had been indiscreet enough to rise at his master's first move but his foot stopped in mid-air in his anxiety to concentrate all his attention on his answer i am a man of few sentimentalities he coldly averred i have loved but one person in my whole life why then should i be expected to mourn over a niece who did not care enough for me to invite me to her wedding it would be an affectation unworthy the man who has at last come to fill his rightful position in this community as the owner of the great moor estate for great it shall be he emphatically continued in three years you will not know the house over yonder despite its fancied ghosts and death-dealing fireplace it will stand a number one in washington i david moore promise you this 
and i am not a man to utter fatuous prophecies but i must be missed over there here he gave the mastiff the long delayed kick rudge stay here the vestibule opposite is icy besides your howls are not wanted in those old walls to-night even if you would go with me which i doubt he has never been willing to cross to that side of the street the old gentleman went on to complain with his first show of irritation but he'll have to overcome that prejudice soon even if i have to tear up the old hearthstone and reconstruct the walls i can't live without rudge and i will not live in any other place than in the old home of my ancestors i was by this time following him out you have failed to answer the suggestion i made you a minute since i hazarded will you pardon me if i put it now as a question your niece mrs jeffrey seemed to have everything in the world to make her happy yet she took her life was there a taint of insanity in her blood or was her nature so impulsive that her astonishing death in so revolting a place should awaken in you so little wonder a gleam of what had made him more or less feared by the very urchins who dogged his steps and made sport of him at a respectful distance shot from his eye as he glowered back at me from the open door but he hastily suppressed this sign of displeasure and replied with the faintest tinge of sarcasm there you are expecting from me feelings which belong to youth or to men of much more heart than understanding i tell you that i have no feelings my niece may have developed insanity or she may simply have drunk her cup of pleasure dry at twenty-two and come to its dregs prematurely i do not know and i do not care what concerns me is that the responsibility of a large fortune has fallen upon me most unexpectedly and that i have pride enough to wish to show myself capable of sustaining the burden besides they may be tempted to do some mischief to the walls or floors over there the police respect no man's property but i am determined they shall respect mine no rippings up or tearings down will i allow unless i stand by to supervise the job i am master of the old homestead now and i mean to show it and with a last glance at the dog who uttered the most mournful of protests in reply he shut the front door and betook himself to the other side of the street as i noticed his assured bearing as he disappeared within the forbidding portal which according to his own story had for so long a time been shut against him i asked myself if the candle which i had noticed lying on his mantel-shelf was of the same make and size as those i had found in my late investigations in the house he was then entering End of chapter five Chapter six of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter six. Gossip. Next morning, the city was in a blaze of excitement. All the burning questions of the hour, the rapid mobilization of the army, and the prospect of a speedy advance on Cuba were forgotten in the one engrossing topic of young mrs jeffrey's death and the awful circumstances surrounding it nothing else was in any one's mouth and but little else in any one's heart her youth her prominence 
her union with a man of such marked attractions as mr jeffrey the tragedy connected with her marriage thrown into the shadow by the still more poignant tragedy which had so suddenly terminated her own life gave to the affair an interest which for those first twenty-four hours did not call for any further heightening by a premature suggestion of murder though i was the hero of the hour and as such subjected to an infinite number of questions i followed the lead of my superiors in this regard and carefully refrained from advancing any theories beyond the obvious one of suicide the moment for self-exploitation was not ripe i did not stand high enough in the confidence of the major or i may say of the lieutenant of my own precinct to risk the triumph i anticipated ultimately by a premature expression of opinion i had an enemy at headquarters or rather one of the men there had always appeared peculiarly interested in showing me up in the worst light the name of this man was durbin and it was he who had uttered something like a slighting remark when on that first night i endeavoured to call the captain's attention to some of the small matters which had offered themselves to me in the light of clues perhaps it was the prospect of surprising him some day which made me so wary now as well as so alert to fill my mind with all known facts concerning the jeffreys one of my first acts was to turn over the files of the star and re-read the following account of the great wedding as it is a sensational description of a sensational event i shall make no apology for the headlines which startled all washington the night they appeared startling termination of the jeffrey moore wedding the traditional doom follows the opening of the old house on waverley avenue one of the guests found lying dead on the library hearthstone letters in his pocket show him to have been one w pfeiffer of denver no interruption to the ceremony follows this ghastly discovery but the guests fly in all directions as soon as the nuptial knot is tied the festivities attendant upon the wedding of miss veronica moore to mr francis jeffrey of this city met with a startling check to-day as most of our readers know the long-closed house on waverley avenue which for nearly a century has been in possession of the bride's family was opened for the occasion at the express wish of the bride for a week the preparations for this great function have been going on when at an early hour this morning a line of carriages drew up in front of the historic mansion and the bridal party entered under its once gloomy but now seemingly triumphant portal the crowds which blocked the street from curb to curb testified to the interest felt by the citizens of washington in this daring attempt to brave the traditions which have marked this house out as solitary and by a scene of joyous festivity make the past forgotten and restore again to usefulness the decayed grandeurs of an earlier time as miss moore is one of washington's most charming women and as this romantic effort naturally lent an extraordinary interest to the ceremony of her marriage a large number of our representative people assembled to witness it and by high noon the scene was one of usual brilliancy halls which had mouldered away in an unbroken silence for years echoed again with laughter and palpitated to the choicest strains of the marine band 
all the doors were open save those of the library an exception which added a pleasing excitement to the occasion and when by chance some of the more youthful guests were caught peering behind the two corinthian pillars guarding these forbidden precincts the memories thus evoked were momentary and the shadow soon passed the wedding had been set for high noon and as the clock in the drawing-room struck the hour every head was craned to catch the first glimpse of the bride coming down the old-fashioned staircase but five minutes ten minutes a half-hour passed without this expectation being gratified the crowd above and below was growing restless when suddenly a cry was heard from beyond the gilded pillars framing the library door and a young lady was seen rushing from the forbidden quarter trembling with dismay and white with horror it was miss abbott of stratford circle who in the interim of waiting had allowed her curiosity to master her dread and by one peep into the room which seemed to exercise over her the fascination of a bluebeard's chamber discovered the outstretched form of a man lying senseless and apparently dead on the edge of the hearthstone the terror which instantly spread amongst the guests shows the hold which superstition has upon all classes of humanity happily however an unseemly panic was averted by the necessity which all felt of preserving some sort of composure till the ceremony for which they had assembled had been performed for simultaneously with this discovery of death in the library there had come from above the sound of the approaching bridal procession and cries were hushed and beating hearts restrained as miss moore's charming face and exquisite figure appeared between the rows of flowering plants with which the staircase was lined no need for the murmur to go about spare the bride let nothing but cheer surround her till she is geoffrey's wife the look of joy which irradiated her countenance and gave a fairy-like aspect to her whole exquisite person would have deterred the most careless and self-centred person there from casting a shadow across her pathway one minute sooner than necessity demanded the richness of the ancestral veil which covered her features and the natural timidity which prevents a bride from lifting her eyes from the floor she traverses saved her from observing the strange looks by which her presence was hailed she was consequently enabled to go through the ceremony in happy unconsciousness of the forced restraint which held that surging mass together but the bridesmaids were not so happy miss tuttle especially held herself upright simply by the exercise of her will and though resplendent in beauty suffered so much in her anxiety for the bride that it was a matter of small surprise when she fainted at the conclusion of the ceremony mr jeffrey showed more composure but the inward excitement under which he was labouring made him trip more than once in his responses as many there noted whose minds were not fixed too strongly on flight only dr auchincloss was quite himself and by means of the solemnity by which he invested his words kept the hubbub down which was already making itself heard on the outskirts of the crowd but even his influence did not prevail beyond the moment devoted to the benediction 
once the sacred words were said such a stampede followed that the bride showed much alarm and it was left for mr jeffrey to explain to her the cause of this astonishing conduct on the part of her guests she bore the disclosure well all things considered and once she was fully assured that the unhappy man whose sudden death had thus interrupted the festivities was an intruder upon the scene and quite unknown not only to herself but to her newly made husband she brightened perceptibly though like every one around her she seemed anxious to leave the house and indeed did so as soon as miss tuttle's condition warranted it the fact that the bride went through the ceremony without her bridal bouquet is looked upon by many as an unfavourable omen in her anxiety not to impose any longer upon the patience of her guests she had descended without it as to the deceased but little is known of him letters found on his person prove his name to be w pfeiffer and his residence denver his presence in miss moore's house at a time so inopportune is unexplained no such name is on the list of wedding guests nor was he recognized as one of miss moore's friends either by mr jeffrey or by such of her relatives and acquaintances as had the courage to enter the library to see him with the exception of the discoloured mark on his temple showing where his head had come in contact with the hearthstone his body presents an appearance of natural robustness which makes his sudden end seem all the more shocking his name has been found registered at the national hotel turning over the files i next came upon the following despatch from denver the sudden death in washington of wallace pfeiffer one of our best known and most respected citizens is deeply deplored by all who knew him and his unfortunate mother he is the last of her three sons all of whom have died within the year the demise of wallace leaves her entirely unprovided for it was not known here that mr pfeiffer intended to visit washington he was supposed to go in quite the opposite direction having said to more than one that he had business in san francisco his intrusion into the house of miss moore during the celebration of a marriage in which he could have taken no personal interest is explained in the following manner by such as knew his mental peculiarities though a merchant by trade and latterly a miner in the klondike he had great interest in the occult and was a strong believer in all kinds of supernatural manifestations he may have heard of the unhappy reputation attaching to the moore house in washington and fascinated by the mystery involved embraced the opportunity afforded by open doors and the general confusion incident to so large a gathering to enter the interesting old place and investigate for himself the fatal library the fact of his having been found secluded in this very room at a moment when every other person in the house was pushing forward to see the bride lends colour to this supposition and his sudden death under circumstances tending to rouse the imagination shows the extreme sensitiveness of his nature he will be buried here the next paragraph was short fresher events were already crowding this three days old wonder to the wall verdict in the case of wallace pfeiffer found lying dead on the hearthstone of the old moore house library concussion of the brain preceded by mental shock or heart failure the body went on to denver to-day 
and below separated by the narrowest of spaces mr and mrs francis jeffrey have decided to give up their wedding tour and spend their honeymoon in washington they will occupy the ransom house on k street the last paragraph brought me back to the question then troubling my mind was it in the household of this newly married pair and in the possible secret passions underlying their union that one should look for the cause of the murderous crime i secretly imagined to be hidden behind this seeming suicide or were these parties innocent and old david moore the one motive power in precipitating a tragedy the result of which had been to enrich him and impoverish them certainly a most serious and important question and one which any man might be pardoned for attempting to answer especially if that man was a young detective lamenting his obscurity and dreaming of a recognition which would yield him fame and the wherewithal to marry a certain clever but mischievous little minx of whom you are destined to hear more but how was that same young detective hampered as he was and held in thrall by a fear of ridicule and a total lack of record to get the chance to push an inquiry requiring opportunities which could only come by special favour this was what i continually asked myself and always without result true i might approach the captain or the mayor with my story of the tell-tale marks i had discovered in the dust covering the southwest chamber mantel shelf and if fortunate enough to find that these had been passed over by the other detectives seek to gain a hearing thereby and secure for myself the privileges i so earnestly desired but my egotism was such that i wished to be sure of the hand which had made these marks before i parted with a secret which once told would make or mar me yet to obtain the slight concession of an interview with any of the principals connected with this crime would be difficult without the aid of one or both of my superiors even to enter the house again where but a few hours before i had made myself so thoroughly at home would require a certain amount of pluck for durbin had been installed there and durbin was a watch-dog whose bite as well as his bark i regarded with considerable respect yet into that house i must sooner or later go if only to determine whether or not i had been alone in my recognition of certain clues pointing plainly toward murder should i trust my lucky star and remain for the nonce quiescent this seemed a wise suggestion and i decided to adopt it comforting myself with the thought that if after a day or two of modest waiting i failed in obtaining what i wished i could then appeal to the lieutenant of my own precinct he i had sometimes felt assured did not regard me with an altogether unfavourable eye meantime i spent all my available time in loitering around newspaper offices and picking up such stray bits of gossip as were offered as no question had yet been raised of any more serious crime than suicide these mostly related to the idiosyncrasies of the moore family and the solitary position into which miss tuttle had been plunged by this sudden death of her only relative as this beautiful and distinguished young woman had been and still was a great belle in her special circle her present homeless if not penniless position led to many surmises would she marry and if so 
to which of the many wealthy or prominent men who had openly courted her would she accord her hand in the present egotistic state of my mind i secretly flattered myself that i was right in concluding that she would say yes to no man's entreaty till a certain newly made widower's year of mourning had expired but this opinion received something of a check when in a quiet talk with the reporter i learned that it was openly stated by those who had courage to speak that the tie which had certainly existed at one time between mr jeffrey and the handsome miss tuttle had been entirely of her own weaving and that the person of veronica moore rather than the large income she commanded had been the attractive power which had led him away from the older sister this seemed improbable for the charms of the poor little bride were not to be compared with those of her maturer sister yet as we all know there are other attractions than those offered by beauty i have since heard it broadly stated that the peculiar twitch of the lip observable in all the moors had proved an irresistible charm in the unfortunate veronica making her a radiant image when she laughed this was by no means a rare occurrence so they said before the fancy took her to be married in the ill-stated home of her ancestors the few lines of attempted explanation which she had left behind for her husband seemed to impose on no one to those who knew the young couple well it was an open proof of her insanity to those who knew them slightly as well as to the public at large it was a woman's way of expressing the disappointment she felt in her husband that i might the more readily determine which of these two theories had the firmest basis in fact i took advantage of an afternoon off and slipped away to alexandria where i had been told mr jeffrey had courted his bride i wanted a taste of local gossip you see and i got it the air was fully charged with it and being careful not to rouse antagonism by announcing myself a detective i readily picked up many small facts brought into shape and arranged in the form of a narrative the result was as follows john judson moore the father of veronica had fewer oddities than the other members of his eccentric family it was thought however that he had shown some strain of the peculiar independence of his race when in selecting a wife he let his choice fall on a widow who was not only encumbered with a child but who was generally regarded as the plainest woman in virginia he who might have had the pick of southern beauty but when in the course of time this despised woman proved to be the possessor of those virtues and social graces which eminently fitted her to conduct the large establishment of which she had been made mistress he was forgiven his lack of taste little more was said of his peculiarities until his wife having died and his child proved weakly he made the will in his brother's favour which has since given that gentleman such deep satisfaction why this proceeding should have been so displeasing to their friends report says not but that it was so is evident from the fact that great rejoicing took place on all sides when veronica suddenly developed into a healthy child and the probability of david moore's inheriting the coveted estate decreased to a minimum 
it was not a long rejoicing however for john judson followed his wife to the grave before veronica had reached her tenth year leaving her and her half-sister cora to the guardianship of a crabbed old bachelor who had been his father's lawyer this lawyer was morose and peevish but he was never positively unkind for two years the sisters seemed happy enough when suddenly and somewhat peremptorily they were separated veronica being sent to a western school where she remained seemingly without a single visit east till she was seventeen during this long absence miss tuttle resided in washington developing under masters into an accomplished woman veronica's guardian severe in his treatment of the youthful owner of the large fortune of which he had been made sole executor was unexpectedly generous to the penniless sister hoping perhaps in his close peevish old heart that the charms and acquired graces of this lovely woman would soon win for her a husband in the brilliant set in which she naturally found herself but cora tuttle was not easy to please and the first men of washington came and went before her eyes without awakening in her any special interest till she met francis jeffrey who stole her heart with a look those who remember her that winter say that under his influence she developed from a handsome woman into a lovely one yet no engagement was announced and society was wondering what held francis jeffrey back from so great a price when veronica moore came home and the question was forever answered veronica was now nearly eighteen and during her absence had blossomed into womanhood she was not as beautiful as her sister but she had a bright and pleasing expression with enough spice in her temperament to rob her girlish features of instipidity and make her conversation witty if not brilliant yet when francis jeffrey turned his attentions from miss tuttle and fixed them without reserve or seeming shame upon this pretty butterfly but one term could be found to characterize the proceeding and that was fortune-hunting of small but settled income he had hitherto shown a certain contentment with his condition calculated to inspire respect and make his attentions to miss tuttle seem both consistent and appropriate but no sooner did veronica's bright eyes appear than he fell at the young heiress's feet and pressed his suit so close and fast that in two months they were engaged and at the end of the half-year married with the disastrous consequences just made known so much for the general gossip of the town now for the special a certain gentleman whom it is unnecessary to name had been present at one critical instant in the lives of these three persons he was not a scandal-monger and if everything had gone on happily if veronica had lived and cora settled down into matrimony he would never have mentioned what he heard and saw one night in the great drawing-room of a hotel in atlantic city it was at the time when the engagement was first announced between jeffrey and the young heiress this and his previous attentions to cora had made much talk both in washington and elsewhere and there were not lacking those who had openly twitted him for his seeming inconsistency this had been over the cups of course 
and geoffrey had borne it well enough from his so-called friends and intimates but when on a certain evening in the parlour of one of the large hotels in atlantic city a fellow whom nobody knew and nobody liked accused him of knowing on which side his bread was buttered and that certainly it was not on the side of beauty and superior attainments geoffrey got angry heedless of who might be within hearing he spoke up very plainly in these words you are all of a kind rank money worshippers and self-seeker or you would not be so ready to see greed in my admiration for miss moore disagreeable as i find it to air my sentiments in this public manner yet since you provoke me to it i will say once and for all that i am deeply in love with miss moore and that it is for this reason only i am going to marry her were she the penniless girl her sister is and miss tuttle the proud possessor of the wealth which in your eyes confers such distinction upon miss moore you would still see me at the latter's feet and at hers only miss tuttle's charms are not potent enough to hold the heart which has once been fixed by her sister's smile this was pointed enough certainly but when at the conclusion of his words a tall figure rose from a year corner and cora tuttle passed the amazed group with a bow i dare warrant that no one of the men composing it but wished himself a hundred miles away geoffrey himself was chagrined and made a move to follow the woman he had so publicly scorned but the look she cast back at him was one to remember and he hesitated what was there left for him to say or even to do the avowal had been made in all its bold frankness and nothing could alter it as for her she behaved beautifully and by no word or look so far as the world knew ever showed that her woman's pride if not her heart had been cut to the quick by the one man she adored with this incident filling my mind i returned to washington i had acquainted myself with the open facts of this family's history but what of its inner life who knew it did any one even the man who confided to me the contretemps in the hotel parlour could not be sure what underlay mr jeffrey's warm advocacy of the woman he had elected to marry he could not even be certain that he had really understood the feeling shown by cora tuttle when she heard the man who had once lavished attentions on her express in this public manner a preference for her sister a woman has great aptness in concealing a mortal hurt and from what i had seen of this one i thought it highly improbable that all was quiet in her passionate breast because she had turned an impassive front to the world i was becoming confused in the maze of my own imaginings to escape the results of this confusion i determined to drop theory and confine myself to facts and thus passed the first few days succeeding the tragic discovery in the moor house End of chapter six chapter seven of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter seven sly work the next morning my duty led me directly in the way of that little friend of mine whom i have already mentioned it is strange how often my duty did lead me in her way she is a demure little creature 
with wits as bright as her eyes which is saying a great deal and while in the course of our long friendship i had admired without making use of the special abilities i saw in her i felt that the time had now come when they might prove of inestimable value to me greeting her with pardonable abruptness i expressed my wishes in these possibly alarming words jenny you can do something for me find out i know you can and that too without arousing suspicion or compromising either of us where mr moore of waverley avenue buys his groceries and when you have done that whether or not he has lately resupplied himself with candles the surprise which she showed had a touch of naivete in it which was very encouraging mr moore she cried the uncle of her who who the very same i responded and waited for her questions without adding a single word in way of explanation she gave me a look oh what a look it was as encouraging to the detective as it was welcome to the lover after which she nodded once in doubt once in question and once in frank and laughing consent and darted off i thanked providence for such a self-contained little aide-de-camp and proceeded on my way in a state of great self-satisfaction an hour later i came upon her again it is really extraordinary how frequently the paths of some people cross well i asked mr moore deals with simpkins just two blocks away from his house and only a week ago he bought some candles there i rewarded her with a smile which summoned into view the most exasperating of dimples you had better patronize simpkins yourself for a little while i suggested and by the arch glance with which my words were received i perceived that my meaning was fully understood experiencing from this moment an increased confidence not only in the powers of my little friend but in the line of investigation thus happily established i cast about for means of settling the one great question which was a necessary preliminary to all future actions whether the marks detected by me in the dust of the mantel in the southwest chamber had been made by the hand of him who had lately felt the need of candles albeit his house appeared to be fully lightened by gas the subterfuge by which notwithstanding my many disadvantages i was finally enabled to obtain unmistakable answer to this query was the fruit of much hard thought perhaps i was too proud of it perhaps i should have mistrusted myself more from the start but i was a great egotist in those days and reckoned quite above their inherent worth any bright ideas which i could safely call my own the point aimed at was this to obtain without moore's knowledge an accurate impression of his finger-tips the task presented difficulties but these served duly to increase my ardour confiding to the lieutenant of the precinct my great interest in the mysterious house with whose suggestive interior i had made myself acquainted under such tragic circumstances i asked him as a personal favour to obtain for me an opportunity of spending another night there he was evidently surprised by the request not cherishing as i suppose any great longings himself in this direction but recognizing that for some reason i set great store on this questionable privilege i do not think that he suspected in the least what that reason was and being as i have intimated favorably disposed to me 
he exerted himself to such good effect that i was formally detailed to assist in keeping watch over the premises that very night i think that it was at this point i began to reckon on the success which after many failures and some mischances was yet to reward my efforts as i prepared to enter the old house at nightfall i allowed myself one short glance across the way to see if my approach had been observed by the man whose secret if secret he had i was laying plans to surprise i was met by a sight i had not expected pausing on the pavement in front of me stood a handsome elderly gentleman whose appearance was so fashionable and thoroughly up to date that i should have failed to recognize him if my glance had not taken in at the same instant the figure of rudge crouching obstinately on the edge of the curb where he had evidently posted himself in distinct refusal to come any farther in vain his master for the well-dressed man before me was no less a personage than the whilom butt of all the boys between the capitol and the treasury building signalled and commanded him to cross to his side nothing could induce the mastiff to budge from that quarter of the street where he felt himself safe mr moore glorying in the prospect of unlimited wealth presented a startling contrast in more ways than one to the poverty-stricken old man whose curious garb and lonely habits had made him an object of ridicule to half the town i own that i was half amused and half awed by the condescending bow with which he greeted my off-hand nod and the affable way in which he remarked you are making use of your prerogatives as a member of the police i see the words came as easily from his lips as if his practice in affability had been of the very longest i wonder how the old place enjoys its present distinction he went on running his eye over the dilapidated walls under which we stood with very evident pride in their vast proportions and the air of gloomy grandeur which signalized them if it partakes in the slightest degree of the feelings of its owner i can vouch for its impatience at the free use which is made of its time-worn rooms and halls are these intrusions necessary now that mrs jeffrey's body has been removed do you feel that the scene of her demise need hold the attention of the police any longer that is a question to put to the superintendent and not to me was my deprecatory reply the major has issued no orders for the watch to be taken off so we men have no choice i am sorry if it offends you doubtless a few days will end the matter and the keys will be given into your hand i suppose you are anxious to move in he cast a glance behind him at his dog gave a whistle which passed unheeded and replied with dignity if but little heart when a man has passed his seventh decade he is not apt to be so patient with delay as when he has a prospect of many years before him i am anxious to enter my own house yes i have much to do there i came very near asking him what but feared to seem too familiar in case he was the cold but upright man he would fain appear and too interested and inquiring if he were the whited sepulchre i secretly considered him so with a nod a trifle more pronounced than if i had been unaffected by either hypothesis i remounted the steps carelessly remarking i'll see you again after taking a turn through the house if i discover anything ghost marks or human marks which might be of interest to you i'll let you know something like a growl answered me 
but whether it came from master or dog i did not stop to inquire i had serious work before me very serious considering that it was to be done on my own responsibility and without the knowledge of my superiors but i was sustained by the thought that no whisper of murder had as yet been heard abroad or at headquarters and that consequently i was interfering in no great case merely trying to formulate one it was necessary for the success of my plan that some time should elapse before i reapproached mr moore i therefore kept my word to him and satisfied my own curiosity by taking a fresh tour through the house naturally in doing this i visited the library here all was dark the faint twilight still illuminating the streets failed to penetrate here i was obliged to light my lantern my first glance was toward the fireplace venturesome hands had been there not only had the fender been drawn out and the grate set aside but the huge settle had been wrenched free from the mantel and dragged into the centre of the room rather pleased at this change for with all my apparent bravado i did not enjoy too close a proximity to the cruel hearthstone i stopped to give this settle a thorough investigation the result was disappointing to all appearance and i did not spare it the experiment of many a thump and knock it was a perfectly innocuous piece of furniture clumsy of build but solid and absolutely devoid of anything that could explain the tragedies which had occurred so near it i even sat down on its musty old cushion and shut my eyes but was unrewarded by alarming visions or a disturbance of any sort nor did the floor where it had stood yield any better results to the inquiring eye nothing was to be seen there but the marks left by the removal of its base from the blackened boards disgusted with myself if not with this object of my present disappointment i left that portion of the room in which it stood and crossed to where i had found the little table on the night of mrs jeffrey's death it was no longer there it had been set back against the wall where it properly belonged and the candelabrum removed nor was the kitchen chair any longer to be seen near the bookshelves this fact small as it was caused me an instant of chagrin i had intended to look again at the book which i had examined with such unsatisfactory results the time before a glance showed me that this book had been pushed back level with the others but i remembered its title and had the means of reaching it been at hand i should certainly have stolen another peep at it upstairs i found the same signs of police interference the shutter had been fastened in the southwest room and the bouquet and wrap taken away from the bed the handkerchief also was missing from the mantel where i had left it and when i opened the closet door it was to find the floor bare and the second candelabrum and candle removed all gone thought i each and every clue but i was mistaken in another moment i came upon the minute filings i had before observed scattered over a small stand concluding from this that they had been passed over by durbin and his associates as valueless i swept them together with the dust in which they lay into an old envelope i happily found in my pocket then i crossed to the mantel and made a close inspection of its now empty shelf the scratches which i had made there were visible enough 
but the impressions for which they stood had vanished in the handling which everything in this house had undergone regarding with great thankfulness the results of my own foresight i made haste to leave the room i then proceeded to take my first steps in the ticklish experiment by which i hoped to determine whether uncle david had had any share in the fatal business which had rendered the two rooms i had just visited so memorable first satisfying myself by a peep through the front drawing-room window that he was politely at watch behind the vines i went directly to the kitchen procured a chair and carried it into the library where i put it to a use that to an onlooker's eye would have appeared very peculiar planting it squarely on the hearthstone not without some secret perturbation as to what the results might be to myself i mounted it and took down the engraving which i have already described as hanging over this mantelpiece setting it on end against one of the jambs of the fireplace i mounted the chair once more and carefully sifted over the high shelf the contents of a little package which i had brought with me for this purpose then leaving the chair where it was i betook myself out of the front door ostentatiously stopping to look at it and put the key in my pocket crossing immediately to mr moore's side of the street i encountered him as i had expected to do at his own gateway well what now he inquired with the same exaggerated courtesy i had noticed in him on a previous occasion you have the air of a man bringing news has anything fresh happened in the old house i assumed a frankness which seemed to impose on him do you know i sententiously informed him i have a wonderful interest in that old hearthstone or rather in the seemingly innocent engraving hanging over it of benjamin franklin at the court of france i tell you frankly that i had no idea of what would be found behind the picture i saw by his quick look that i had stirred up a hornet's nest this was just what i had calculated to do behind it he repeated there is nothing behind it i laughed shrugged my shoulders and backed slowly toward the door of course you should know i retorted with some condescension then as if struck by a sudden remembrance oh by the way have you been told that there is a window on that lower floor which does not stay fastened i speak of it that you may have it repaired as soon as the police vacate it's the last one in the hall leading to the negro quarters if you shake it hard enough the catch falls back and any one can raise it even from the outside i will see to it he replied dropping his eyes possibly to hide their curious twinkle but what do you mean about finding something in the wall behind that old picture i've never heard but though he spoke quickly and shouted the last words after me at the top of his voice i was by this time too far away to respond save by a dubious smile and a semi-patronizing wave of the hand not until i was nearly out of earshot did i venture to shout back the following words i'll be back in an hour if anything happens if the boys annoy you or any one attempts to enter the old house telephone to the station or summon the officer at the corner i don't believe any harm will come from leaving the place to itself for a while then i walked around the block when i arrived in front again it was quite dark so was the house but there was light in the library i felt assured that i would find uncle david there and i did 
when after a noiseless entrance and a careful advance through the hall i threw open the door beyond the gilded pillars it was to see the tall figure of this old man mounted upon the chair i had left there peering up at the nail from which i had so lately lifted the picture he started as i presented myself and almost fell from the chair but the careless laugh i uttered assured him of the little importance i played upon this evidence of his daring and unappeasable curiosity and he confronted me with an enviable air of dignity whereupon i managed to say really mr moore i'm glad to see you here it is quite natural for you to wish to learn by any means in your power what that picture concealed i came back because i suddenly remembered that i had forgotten to rehang it involuntarily he glanced again at the wall overhead which was as bare as his hand save for the nail he had already examined it has concealed nothing he retorted you can see yourself that the wall is bare and that it rings as sound as any chimney-piece ever made here he struck it heavily with his fist what did you imagine that you had found i smiled shrugged my shoulders in a tantalizing repetition of my former action upon a like occasion and then answered brusquely i did not come back to betray police secrets but to restore this picture to its place or perhaps you prefer to have it down rather than up it isn't much of an ornament he scrutinized me darkly from over his shoulder a weary gleam showing itself in his shrewd old eyes and the idea crossed me that the moment might possess more significance than appeared but i did not step backward nor give evidence in any way that i had even thought of danger i simply laid my hand on the picture and looked up at him for orders he promptly signified that he wished it hung adding as i hesitated these words the pictures in this house are supposed to stay on the walls where they belong there is a traditional superstition against removing them i immediately lifted the print from the floor no doubt he had me at disadvantage if evil was in his heart and my position on the hearth was as dangerous as previous events had proved it to be but it would not do to show the white feather at this moment when his fate if not my own hung in the balance so motioning him to step down i put my foot on the chair and raised the picture aloft to hang it as i did so he moved over to the huge settle of his ancestors and crossing his arms over his back surveying me with a smile i rather imagined than saw suddenly as i strained to put the cord over the nail he called out look look out you'll fall if he had intended to give me a start in payment for my previous rebuff he did not succeed for my nerves had grown steady and my arm firm at the glimpse i had caught of the shelf below me the fine brown powder i had scattered there had been displaced in five distinct spots and not by my fingers i had preferred to risk the loss of my balance rather than rest my hand on the shelf but he had taken no such precaution the clue i so anxiously desired and for which i had so recklessly worked was obtained but when half an hour later i found an opportunity of measuring these marks and comparing them with those upstairs i did not enjoy the full triumph i had promised myself for the two impressions utterly failed to coincide thus proving that whoever the person was who had been in this house with mrs jeffrey on the evening she died it was not her uncle david End of chapter seven
Chapter Eight of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Eight. Slyer woes. Let me repeat: the person who had left the marks of his presence in the upper chamber of the Moore House was not the man popularly known as Uncle David. Who then had it been? but one name suggested itself to me mr jeffrey it was not so easy for me to reach this man as it had been for me to reach his singular and unimaginative uncle in the first place his door had been closed to every one since his wife's death neither friends nor strangers could gain admittance there unless they came vested with authority from the coroner and this even if i could manage to obtain it would not answer in my case what i had to say and do would better follow a chance encounter but no chance encounter with this gentleman seemed likely to fall to my lot and finally i swallowed my pride and asked another favour of the lieutenant would he see that i was given an opportunity for carrying some message or of doing some errand which would lead to my having an interview with mr jeffrey if he would i stood ready to promise that my curiosity should stop at this point and that i would cease to make a nuisance of myself i think he suspected me by this time but he made no remark and in a day or so i was summoned to carry a note to the house in k street mrs jeffrey's funeral had taken place the day before and the house looked deserted but my summons speedily brought a neat-looking but very nervous maid to the door whose eyes took on an unmistakable expression of resistance when i announced my errand and asked to see mr jeffrey the expression would not have struck me as peculiar if she had raised any objection to the interview i had solicited but she did not her fear and antipathy consequently sprang from some other source than her interest in the man most threatened by my visit was it could it be on her own account recalling what i had heard whispered about the station concerning a maid of the jeffreys who always seemed on the point of saying something which never really left her lips i stopped her as she was about to slip upstairs and quietly asked are you loretta the way she turned the way she looked at me as she gave me a short affirmative and then quickly proceeded on her way convinced me that my colleagues were right as to her being a woman who had some cause for dreading police interference i instantly made up my mind that here was a mine to be worked and that i knew just the demure little soul best equipped to act the part of miner in a moment she came back and i had a chance to note again her pretty but expressionless features among which the restless eyes alone bespoke character or decision mr jeffreys is in the back room upstairs she announced he says for you to come up is it the room mrs jeffrey used to occupy i asked with open curiosity as i passed her an involuntary shudder proved that she was not without feeling so did the quick disclaimer no no those rooms are closed he occupies the ones miss tuttle had before she went away oh then miss tuttle is gone loretta disdained to answer she had already said enough to cause her to bite her lip as she disappeared down the basement stair decidedly the boys were right an uneasy feeling followed any conversation with this girl yet while there was slyness in her manner there was a certain frank honesty visible in it too 
which caused me to think that if she could ever be made to speak her evidence could be relied on mr jeffrey was sitting with his back to the door when i entered but turned as i spoke his name and held out his hand for the note i carried i had no expectation of his remembering me as one of the men who had stood about that night in the moor house and i was not disappointed to him i was merely a messenger a common policeman and he consequently paid me no attention while i bestowed upon him the most concentrated scrutiny of my whole life till now i had seen him only in half-lights or under circumstances precluding my getting a very accurate idea of him as a man and a gentleman now he sat with the broad daylight on his face and i had every opportunity for noting both his features and expression he was of a distinguished type but the cloud enshrouding him was as heavy as any i had ever seen darkening about a man of his position and character his manner fettered though it was by gloomy thoughts was not just the manner i had expected to encounter he had a large clear eye but the veil which hid the brightness of his regard was misty with suspicion not with tears he appeared to shrink from observation and shifted uneasily as long as i stood in front of him though he said nothing and did not lift his eyes from the letter he was perusing till he heard me step back to the door i had purposely left open and softly close it then he glanced up with a keen if not an alarmed look which seemed an exaggerated one for the occasion that is if he had no secret to keep do you suffer from draughts he asked rising in a way which in itself was a dismissal i smiled an amused denial then with the simple directness i thought most likely to win me his confidence entered straight upon my business in these plain words pardon me mr jeffrey i have something to say which is not exactly fitted for the ears of servants then as he pushed his chair suddenly back i added reassuringly it is not a police matter sir but an entirely personal one it may strike you as important and it may not mr jeffrey i was the man who made the unhappy discovery in the moor mansion which has plunged this house into mourning this announcement startled him and produced a visible change in his manner his eyes flew first to one door and then to another as if it were he who feared intrusion now i beg your pardon for speaking on so painful a topic i went on as soon as i saw he was ready to listen to me my excuse is that i came upon a little thing that same night which i have not thought of sufficient importance to mention to any one else but which it may interest you to hear about here i took from a book i held a piece of blotting paper it was white on one side and blue on the other the white side i had thickly chalked though this was not apparent lying down this piece of blotting paper chalked sight up on the end of a large table near which we were standing i took out an envelope from my pocket and shaking it gently to and fro remarked in an upper room of the moor house you remember the southwest chamber sir ay didn't he there was no misdoubting the quick emotion the shrinking and the alarm with which he heard this room mentioned it was in that room that i found these tipping up the envelope 
i scattered over the face of the blotter a few of the glistening particles i had collected from the place mentioned he bent over them astonished then as was natural brushed them together in a heap with the tips of his fingers and leaned to look again just as i breathed a heavy sigh which scattered them far and wide instinctively he withdrew his hand whereupon i embraced the opportunity of turning the blotter over uttering meanwhile the most profuse apologies then as if anxious not to repeat my misadventure i let the blotter lie where it was and pouring out the few remaining particles into my palm i held them towards the light in such a way that he was compelled to lean across the table in order to see them naturally for i had planned the distance well his finger-tips white with the chalk he had unconsciously handled touched the blue surface of the blotter now lying uppermost and left their marks there i could have shouted my elation at the success of this risky manoeuvre but managed to suppress my emotion and to stand quite still while he took a good look at the filings they seemed to have great and unusual interest for him and it was with no ordinary emotion that he finally asked what do you make of these and why do you bring them here my answer was written under his hand but this it was far from my policy to impart so putting on my friendliest air i returned with suitable respect i don't know what to make of them they look like gold but that is for you to decide do you want them sir no he replied starting erect and withdrawing his hand from the blotter it's but a trifle not worth our attention but i thank you just the same for bringing it to my notice and again his manner became a plain dismissal this time i accepted it as such without question carelessly restoring the piece of blotting-paper to the book from which i had taken it i made a bow and withdrew towards the door he seemed to be thinking and the deep furrows which i am sure had been lacking from his brow a week previous became startlingly visible finally he observed mrs jeffrey was not in her right mind when she so unhappily took her life i see now that the change in her dates back to the wedding day consequently any little peculiarity she may have shown at that time is not to be wondered at certainly not i boldly ventured if such peculiarities were shown after the fright given her by the catastrophe which took place in the library his eyes which were fixed on mine flashed and his hands closed convulsively we will not consider the subject he muttered reseating himself in the chair from which he had risen i bowed again and went out i did not dwell on the interview in my own mind nor did i allow myself to draw any conclusions from it till i had carried the blotter into the southwest chamber of the moor house and carefully compared the impressions made on it with the marks i had scratched on the surface of the mantel-shelf this i did by laying the one over the other after having made holes where his finger-tips had touched the blotter the holes in the blotter and the marks outlined upon the shelf coincided exactly End of chapter eight chapter nine of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline
chapter nine jinny i have already mentioned the man whom i secretly looked upon as standing between me and all preferment he was a good-looking fellow but he wore a natural sneer which for some reason i felt to be always directed toward myself this sneer grew pronounced about this time and that was the reason no doubt why i continued to work as long as i did in secret i dreaded the open laugh of this man a laugh which always seemed hovering on his lips and which was only held in restraint by the awe we all felt of the major notwithstanding i made one slight move encountering the deputy coroner i ventured to ask if he was quite satisfied with the evidence collected in the jeffrey case his surprise did not prevent him from asking my reasons for this question i replied to this effect because i have a little friend winsome enough and subtle enough to warm the truth out of the devil i hear that the girl loretta is suspected of knowing more about this unfortunate tragedy than she is willing to impart if you wish this little friend of mine to talk to her i will see that she does so and does so with effect the deputy coroner looked interested whom do you mean by little friend and what is her name i will send her to you and i did the next day i was standing on the corner of vermont avenue when i saw jinny advancing from the house in k street she was chipper and she was smiling in a way which made me say to myself it is fortunate that durbin is not here for jinny's one weakness is her lack of power to hide the satisfaction she takes in any detective work that comes her way i had told her of this and had more than once tried to impress upon her that her smile was a complete giveaway but i noticed that if she kept it from her lips it forced its way out of her eyes and if she kept it out of her eyes it beamed like an inner radiance from her whole face so i gave up the task of making her perfect and let her go on smiling glad that she had such frequent cause for it this morning her smile had a touch of pride in it as well as of delight and noting this i remarked you have made loretta talk her head went up and a demure dimple appeared in her cheek what did she say i urged what has she been keeping back you will have to ask the coroner my orders were strict to bring the results of my interview immediately to him does that include durbin does it include you i am afraid not you are right but why shouldn't it include you what do you mean jinny why do you keep your own counsel so long you have ideas about this crime i know why not mention them jinny a word to the wise is sufficient she laughed and turned her pretty face towards the coroner's once but she was a woman and could not help glancing back and meeting my dubious look she broke into an arch smile and naively added this remark loretta is a busybody ashamed of her own curiosity so much there can be no harm in telling you when one's knowledge has been gained by lingering behind doors and peeping through cracks one is not so ready to say what one has seen and heard loretta is in that box and being more than a little scared of the police was glad to let her anxiety and her fears overflow into a sympathizing ear won't she be surprised when she is called up some fine day by the coroner i wonder if she will blame me for it she will never think of doing so 
i basely assured my little friend with an appreciative glance at her sparkling eye and dimpled cheek the arch little creature started to move off again as she did so she cried be good and don't let durbin cut in on you but stopped for the second time when half across the street and when obedient to her look i hastily rejoined her she whispered demurely oh i forgot to tell you something that i heard this morning and which nobody but yourself has any right to know i was following your commands and buying groceries at simpkins when just as i was coming out with my arms full i heard old mr simpkins mention mr jeffrey's name and with such interest that i naturally wanted to hear what he had to say having no real excuse for staying i poked my finger into a bag of sugar i was carrying till the sugar ran out and i had to wait till it was put up again this did not take long but it took long enough for me to hear the old grocer say that he knew mr jeffrey and that that gentleman had come into his shop only a day or two before his wife's death to buy candles the archness with which this was said together with the fact itself made me her slave for ever as her small figure faded from sight down the avenue i decided to take her advice and follow up whatever communication she had to make to the coroner by a confession of my own suspicions and what they had led me into if he laughed well i could stand it it was not the coroner's laugh nor even the major's that i feared it was durbin's End of chapter 9chapter ten of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter ten francis jeffrey jinny had not been gone an hour from the coroner's office when an opportunity was afforded for me to approach that gentleman myself with few apologies and no preamble i immediately entered upon my story which i made as concise and as much to the point as possible i did not expect praise from him but i did look for some slight show of astonishment at the nature of my news i was therefore greatly disappointed when after a moment's quiet consideration he carelessly remarked very good very good the one point you make is excellent and may prove of use to us we had reached the same conclusion but by another road you ask who blew out the candle we who tied the pistol to mrs jeffrey's arm it could not have been tied by herself who was her accessory then ah you didn't think of that i flushed as if a pail of hot water had been dashed suddenly over me he was right the conclusion he spoke of had failed to strike me why it was a perfectly obvious one as obvious as that the candle had been blown out by another breath than hers yet absorbed in my own train of thought i had completely overlooked it the coroner observing my embarrassment smiled and my humiliation was complete or would have been had durbin been there but fortunately he was not i am a fool i cried i thought i had discovered something i might have known that there were keener minds than mine in this office easy easy was the good-natured interruption you have done well if i did not think so i would not keep you here a minute as it is i am disposed to let you see that in a case like this one man must not expect to monopolize all the honours this matter of the bow of ribbon would strike any old and experienced official i only wonder that we have not seen it openly discussed in the papers taking a box from his desk he opened it and held it out toward me a coil of white ribbon surmounted by a crisp and dainty bow met my eyes you recognize it he asked indeed i did 
it was cut from her wrist by my deputy miss tuttle wished him to untie it but he preferred to leave the bow intact now lift it out careful man don't soil it you will see why in a minute as i held the ribbon up he pointed at some spots on its fresh white surface do you see those he asked those are dust marks and they were made as truly by some one's fingers as the impressions you noticed on the mantel-shelf in the upper chamber this pistol was tied to her wrist after the deed possibly by that same hand it was my own conclusion but it did not sound as welcome to me from his lips as i had expected either my nature is narrow or my inordinate jealousy lays me open to the most astonishing inconsistencies for no sooner had he spoken these words than i experienced a sudden revulsion against my own theory and the suspicions which it threw upon the man whom an hour before i was eager to proclaim a criminal but coroner z gave me no chance for making such a fool of myself rescuing the ribbon from my hands which no doubt were running a little too freely over its snowy surface he smiled with the indulgence proper from such a man to a novice like myself and observed quite frankly you will consider these observations as confidential you know how to hold your tongue that you have proved hold it then a little longer the case is not yet ripe mr jeffrey is a man of high standing with a hitherto unblemished reputation it won't do my boy to throw the doubt of so hideous a crime upon so fine a gentleman without ample reason that no such mistake may be made and that he may have every opportunity for clearing himself i am going to have a confidential talk with him do you want to be present i flushed again but this time from extreme satisfaction i am obliged for your confidence said i then with a burst of courage born of his good nature i inquired with due respect if my little friend had answered his expectations was she as clever as i said i asked your little friend is a trump was his blunt reply with what we have learned through her and now through you we can approach mr jeffrey to some purpose it appears that before leaving the house on that thursday morning he had an interview with his wife which ought in some way to account for this tragedy perhaps he will tell us about it and perhaps he will explain how he came to wander through the moor house while his wife lay dying below at all events we will give him the opportunity to do so and if possible to clear up mysteries which provoke the worst kind of conjecture it is time the ideas advanced by the papers foster superstition and superstition is the devil go and tell my man out there that i am going to k street you may say we oui if you like he added with a humour more welcome to me than any serious concession did i feel set up for this rather mr jeffrey was expecting us this was evident from his first look though the attempt he made at surprise was instantaneous and very well feigned indeed i think he was in a constant state of apprehension during these days and that no inroad of the police would have astonished him but expectation does not preclude dread indeed it tends to foster it and dread was in his heart this he had no power to conceal to what am i indebted for this second visit from you he asked of coroner z with an admirable presence of mind are you not yet satisfied with what we have been able to tell you of my poor wife's unhappy end we are not was the plain response there are some things you have not attempted to explain mr jeffrey for instance why you went to the moor house previous to your being called there by the death of your wife it was a shot that told an arrow which found its mark mr jeffrey flushed then turned pale 
rallied again and lost himself in a maze of conflicting emotions from which he only emerged to say how do you know i was there have i said so or do those old walls babble in their sleep old walls have been known to do this was the grave reply whether they had anything to say in this case is at present quite immaterial that you were where i charged you with being is evident from your own manner may i then ask if you have anything to say about this visit when a person has died under such peculiar circumstances as mrs jeffrey everything bearing upon the case is of interest to the coroner i was sorry he added that last sentence sorry that he felt obliged to qualify his action by anything savouring of apology for the time spent in its utterance afforded his agitated hearer an opportunity not only of collecting himself but of preparing an answer for which he would not have been ready an instant before mrs jeffrey's death was a strange one her husband admitted with a tardy self-control i find myself as much at a loss to understand it as you do and am therefore quite ready to answer the question you have so openly broached not that my answer has any bearing upon the point you wish to make but because it is your due and my pleasure i did visit the moore house as i certainly had every right to do the property was my wife's and it was for my interest to learn if i could the secret of its many crimes ah mr jeffrey looked quickly up you think that an odd thing for me to do at night yes night is the time for such work i did not care to be seen pottering around there in daylight no yet it would have been so much easier you would not have had to buy candles or carry a pistol or i did not carry a pistol the only pistol carried there was the one with which my demented wife chose to take her life i do not understand this allusion it grew out of a misunderstanding of the situation mr jeffrey excuse me if i supposed you would be likely to provide yourself with some means of defence in venturing alone upon the scene of so many mysterious deaths i took no precaution and needed none i suppose and needed none when was this visit paid mr jeffrey before or after your wife pulled the trigger which ended her life you need not hesitate to answer i do not the elegant gentleman before us had acquired a certain fierceness why should i certainly you don't think that i was there at the same time she was it was not on the same night even so much the walls should have told you and probably did or my wife's uncle mr david moore was he not your informant no mr moore has failed to call our attention to this fact did you meet mr moore during the course of your visit to a neighbourhood over which he seems to hold absolute sway not to my knowledge but his house is directly opposite and as he has little to do but amuse himself with what he can see from his front window i concluded that he might have observed me going in you entered by the front door then how else and on what night mr jeffrey made an effort these questions were visibly harassing him the night before the one the one which ended all my earthly happiness he added in a low voice coroner z cast a glance at me i remembered the lack of dust on the nest of little tables from which the upper one had been drawn forward to hold the candelabrum and gently shook my head the coroner's eyebrows went up but none of his disbelief crept into his voice as he made this additional statement the night on which you failed to return to your own house 
instantly mr jeffrey betrayed a nervous action which was quite involuntary that his outward calm was slowly giving way under a fire of questions for which he had no ready reply it was odd you're not going home that night the coroner coldly pursued the misunderstanding you had with your wife immediately after breakfast must have been a very serious one more serious than you have hitherto acknowledged i had rather not discuss the subject protested mr jeffrey then as if he suddenly recognized the official character of his interlocutor he hastily added unless you positively request me to do so in which case i must i am afraid that i must insist upon it returned the other you will find that it will be insisted upon at the inquest and if you do not wish to subject yourself to much unnecessary unpleasantness you had better make clear to us to-day the cause of that special quarrel which to all intents and purposes led to your wife's death i will try to do so returned mr jeffrey rising and pacing the room in his intense restlessness we did have some words her conduct the night before had not pleased me i am naturally jealous vilely jealous and i thought she was a little frivolous at the german ambassador's ball but i had no idea she would take my sharp speeches so much to heart i had no idea that she would care so much or that i should care so much a little jealousy is certainly pardonable in a bridegroom and if her mind had not already been upset she would have remembered how i loved her and hopefully waited for a reconciliation you did love your wife then it was you and not she who had a right to be jealous i have heard the contrary stated it is a matter of public gossip that you loved another woman previous to your acquaintance with miss moore a woman whom your wife regarded with sisterly affection and subsequently took into her new home miss tuttle mr jeffrey stopped in his walk to fling out this ejaculation i admire and respect miss tuttle he went on to declare but i never loved her not as i did my wife he finished but with a certain hard accent apparent enough to a sensitive ear pardon me it is as difficult for me to put these questions as it is for you to hear them were you and miss tuttle ever engaged i started this was a question which half of washington had been asking itself for the last three months would mr jeffrey answer it or remembering that these questions were rather friendly than official refuse to satisfy a curiosity which he might well consider intrusive the set aspect of his features promised little in the way of information and we were both surprised when a moment later he responded with a grim emphasis hardly to be expected from one of his impulsive temperament unhappily no my attentions never went so far instantly the coroner pounced on the one weak word which mr jeffrey had let fall unhappily he repeated why do you say unhappily mr jeffrey flushed and seemed to come out of some dream did i say unhappily he inquired well i repeat it miss tuttle would never have given me any cause for jealousy the coroner bowed and for the present dropped her name out of the conversation you speak again of the jealousy aroused in you by your wife's impetuosities was this increased or diminished by the tone of the few lines she left behind her the response was long in coming it was hard for this man to lie the struggle he made at it was pitiful as i noted what it cost him i began to have new and curious thoughts concerning him and the whole matter under discussion 
i shall never overcome the remorse roused in me by those few lines he finally rejoined she showed a consideration for me what the coroner's exclamation showed all the surprise he felt mr jeffrey tottered under it then grew slowly pale as if only through our amazed looks he had come to realize the charge of inconsistency to which he had laid himself open i mean he endeavoured to explain that mrs jeffrey showed an unexpected tenderness toward me by taking all the blame of our misunderstanding upon herself it was generous of her and will do much toward making my memory of her a gentle one he was forgetting himself again indeed his manner and attempted explanations were full of contradictions to emphasize this fact coroner z exclaimed i should think so she paid a heavy penalty for her professed lack of love you believe that her mind was unseated does not her action show it unseated by the mishap occurring at her marriage yes you really think that yes by anything that passed between you yes may i ask you to tell us what passed between you on this point yes he uttered the monosyllable so often it seemed to come unconsciously from his lips but he recognized almost as soon as we did that it was not a natural reply to the last question and making a gesture of apology he added with the same monotony of tone which had characterized these replies she spoke of her strange guest's unaccountable death more than once and whenever she did so it was with an unnatural excitement and in an unbalanced way this was so noticeable to us all that the subject presently was tabooed among us but though she henceforth spared us all allusion to it she continued to talk about the house itself and of the previous deaths which had occurred there till we were forced to forbid that topic also she was never really herself after crossing the threshold of this desolate house to be married the shadow which lurks within its walls fell at that instant upon her life may god have mercy the prayer remained unfinished his head which had fallen on his breast sank lower he presented the aspect of one who is quite done with life even its sorrows but men in the position of coroner z cannot afford to be compassionate everything the bereaved man said deepened the impression that he was acting a part to make sure that this was really so the coroner with just the slightest touch of sarcasm quietly observed and to ease your wife's mind the wife you were so deeply angered with you visited this house and at an hour which you should have spent in reconciliation with her went through its ancient rooms in the hope of what mr jeffrey could not answer the words which came from his lips were mere ejaculations i was restless mad i found this adventure diverting i had no real purpose in mind not when you looked at the old picture the old picture what old picture the old picture in the southwest chamber you took a look at that didn't you got up on a chair on purpose to do so mr jeffrey winced but he made a direct reply yes i gave a look at that old picture got up as you say on a chair to do so wasn't that the freak of an idle man wandering he hardly knows why from room to room in an old and deserted house his tormentor did not answer probably his mind was on his next line of inquiry 
but mr jeffrey did not take his silence with the calmness he had shown prior to the last attack as no words came from his unwelcome guest he paused in his rapid pacing and casting aside with one impulsive gesture his hitherto imperfectly held restraint he cried out sharply why do you ask me these questions in tones of such suspicion is it not plain enough that my wife took her own life under a misapprehension of my state of mind toward her that you should feel it necessary to rake up these personal matters which however interesting to the world at large are of a painful nature to me mr jeffrey retorted the other with a sudden grave assumption of dignity not without its effect in a case of such serious import we do nothing without purpose we ask these questions and show this interest because the charge of suicide which has hitherto been made against your wife is not entirely sustained by the facts at least she was not alone when she took her life some one was in the house with her it was startling to observe the effect of this declaration upon him impossible he cried out in a protest as forcible as it was agonized you are playing with my misery she could have had no one there she would not there is not a man living before whom she would have fired that deadly shot unless it was myself unless it was my own wretched miserable self the remorseful whisper in which those final words were uttered carried them to my heart which for some strange and unaccountable reason had been gradually turning towards this man but my less easily affected companion seeing his opportunity and possibly considering that it was his gentleman's right to know in what a doubtful light he stood before the law remarked with as light a touch of irony as was possible you should know better than we in whose presence she would choose to die if she did so choose also who would be likely to tie the pistol to her wrist and blow out the candle when the dreadful deed was over the laugh which seemed to be the only means of violent expression remaining to this miserable man was kept down by some amazing thought which seemed to paralyse him without making any attempt to refute a suggestion that fell just short of a personal accusation he sank down in the first chair he came to and became as it were lost in the vision of that ghastly ribbon tying and the solitary blowing out of the candle upon this scene of mournful death then with a struggling sense of having heard something which called for an answer he rose blindly to his feet and managed to let fall these words you are mistaken no one was there or if any one was it was not i there is a man in this city who can prove it but when mr jeffrey was asked to give the name of this man he showed confusion and presently was obliged to admit that he could neither recall his name nor remember anything about him but that he was some one whom he knew well and who knew him well he affirmed that the two had met and spoken near soldiers home shortly after the sun went down and that the man would be sure to remember this meeting if we could only find him as soldiers home was several miles from the moore house and quite out of the way of all his accustomed haunts coroner z asked him how he came to be there he replied that he had just come from rock creek cemetery that he had been in a wretched state of mind all day and possibly being influenced by what he had heard of the yearly vigils mr moore was in the habit of keeping there 
had taken a notion to stroll among the graves in search of the rest and peace of mind he had failed to find in his aimless walks about the city at least that was the way he chose to account for the meeting he mentioned falling into reverie again he seemed to be trying to recall the name which at this moment was of such importance to him but it was without avail as he presently acknowledged i cannot remember who it was my brain is whirling and i can recollect nothing but that this man and myself left the cemetery together on the night mentioned just as the gate was being closed as it closes at sundown the hour can be fixed to a minute it was somewhere near seven i believe near enough i am sure for it to have been impossible for me to be at the moore house at the time my unhappy wife is supposed to have taken her life there is no doubt about your believing this he demanded with sudden haughtiness as rising to his feet he confronted us in all the pride of his exceptionally handsome person we wish to believe it assented the coroner rising in his turn that our belief may become certainty will you let us know the instant you recall the name of the man you talked with at the cemetery gate his testimony far more than any word of yours will settle this question which otherwise may prove a vexed one mr jeffrey's hand went up to his head was he acting a part or did he really forget just what it was for his own best welfare to remember if he had forgotten it argued that he was in a state of greater disturbance on that night than would naturally be occasioned by a mere lover's quarrel with his wife did the same thought strike my companion i cannot say i can only give you his next words you have said that your wife would not be likely to end her life in presence of any one but yourself yet you must see that some one was with her how do you propose to reconcile your assertions with a fact so undeniable i cannot reconcile them it would madden me to try if i thought any one was with her at that moment well mr jeffrey's eyes fell and a startling change passed over him but before either of us could make out just what this change betokened he recovered his aspect of fixed melancholy and quietly remarked it is dreadful to think of her standing there alone aiming a pistol at her young passionate heart but it is worse to picture her doing this under the gaze of unsympathizing eyes i cannot and will not so picture her you have been misled by appearances or what in police parlance is called a clue evidently he did not mean to admit the possibility of the pistol having been fired by any other hand than her own this the coroner noted bowing with the respect he showed every man before a jury had decided upon his guilt he turned toward the door out of which i had already hurried we hope to hear from you in the morning he called back significantly as he stepped down the stairs mr jeffrey did not answer he was having his first struggle with the new and terrible prospect awaiting him at the approaching inquest End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven, Part One of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Book Two, The Law and Its Victim, Chapter Eleven, Details, Part One. The days of my obscurity were over. Henceforth, I was regarded as a decided factor in this case a case which from this time on assumed another aspect both at headquarters and in the midst of people at large 
the reporters whom we had hitherto managed to hold in check now overflowed both the coroner's office and police headquarters and articles appeared in all the daily papers with just enough suggestion in them to fire the public mind and make me for one anticipate an immediate word from mr jeffrey calculated to establish the alibi he had failed to make out on the day we talked with him but no such word came his memory still played him false and no alternative was left but to pursue the official inquiry in the line suggested by the interview just recounted no proceeding in which i had been engaged interested me as did this inquest in the first place the spectators were of a very different character from the ordinary as i warmed myself along to the seat accorded to such witnesses as myself i brushed by men of the very highest station and a few of the lowest and bent my head more than once in response to the inquiring gaze of some fashionable lady who never before i warrant had found herself in such a scene by the time i reached my place all the others were seated and the coroner rapped for order i was first to take the stand what i said has already been fully amplified in the foregoing pages of course my evidence was confined to facts but some of these facts were new to most of the persons there it was evident that a considerable effect was produced by them not only on the spectators but upon the witnesses themselves for instance it was the first time that the marks on the mantel-shelf had been heard of outside the major's office or the story so told as to make it evident that mrs jeffrey could not have been alone in the house at the time of her death a photograph had been taken of those marks and my identification of this photograph closed my testimony as i returned to my seat i stole a look toward a certain corner where with face bent down upon his hand francis jeffrey sat between uncle david and the heavily veiled figure of miss tuttle had there dawned upon him as my testimony was given any suspicion of the trick by which he had been proved responsible for those marks it was impossible to tell from the way miss tuttle's head was turned toward him one might judge him to be labouring under an emotion of no ordinary character though he sat like a statue and hardly seemed to realise how many eyes were at that moment riveted upon his face i was followed by other detectives who had been present at the time and who corroborated my statement as to the appearance of this unhappy woman and the way the pistol had been tied to her arm then the doctor who had acted under the coroner was called after a long and no doubt learned description of the bullet wound which had ended the life of this unhappy lady a wound which he insisted with a marked display of learning must have made that end instantaneous or at least too immediate for her to move foot or hand after it he was asked if the body showed any other mark of violence to this he replied there was a minute wound at the base of one of her fingers the one which is popularly called the wedding finger this statement made all the women present start with renewed interest nor was it altogether without point for the men especially when the doctor went on to say the hands were entirely without rings as mrs jeffrey had been married with a ring i noticed their absence was this wound which you characterize as minute a recent one it had bled a little 
it was an abrasion such as would be made if the ring she usually wore there had been drawn off with a jerk that was the impression i received from its appearance i do not state that it was so made a little thrill which went over the audience at the picture this evoked communicated itself to miss tuttle who trembled violently it even produced a slight display of emotion in mr jeffrey whose hand shook where he pressed it against his forehead but neither uttered a sound nor looked up when the next witness was summoned this witness proved to be loretta who on hearing her name called evinced great reluctance to come forward but after two or three words uttered in her ear by the friendly jinny who had been given a seat next her she stepped into the place assigned her with a suddenly assumed air of great boldness which set upon her with scant grace she had need of all the boldness at her command for the eyes of all in the room were fixed on her with the exception of the two persons most interested in her testimony scrutiny of any kind did not appear to be acceptable to her if one could read the trepidation visible in the short quick upheavals of the broad collar which covered her uneasy breast was this shrinking on her part due to natural timidity or had she failings to avow which while not vitiating her testimony would certainly cause her shame in the presence of so many men and women i was not able to decide this question immediately for after the coroner had elicited her name and the position she held in mr jeffrey's household he asked whether her duties took her into mrs jeffrey's room upon her replying that they did he further inquired if she knew mrs jeffrey's rings and could say whether they were all to be found on that lady's toilet table after the police came in with the news of her death the answer was decisive they were all there her rings and all the other ornaments she was in the daily habit of wearing with the exception of her watch that was not there did you take up those rings no sir did you see any one else take them up no sir not till the officer did so very well loretta sit down again till we hear what durbin has to say about these rings and then the man i hated came forward and though i shrank from acknowledging it even to myself i could but observe how strong and quiet and self-possessed he seemed and how decisive was his testimony but it was equally brief he had taken up the rings and he had looked at them and on one the wedding ring he had detected a slight stain of blood he had called mr jeffrey's attention to it but that gentleman had made no comment this remark had the effect of concentrating general attention upon mr jeffrey but he seemed quite oblivious of it his attitude remained unchanged and only from the quick stretching out and withdrawal of miss tuttle's hand could it be seen that anything had been said calculated to touch or arouse this man the coroner cast an uneasy glance in his direction then he motioned durbin aside and recalled loretta and now i began to be sorry for the girl it is hard to have one's weaknesses exposed especially if one is more foolish than wicked but there was no way of letting this girl off without sacrificing certain necessary points and the coroner went relentlessly to work how long have you been in this house three weeks ever since mrs jeffrey's wedding day sir were you there when she first came as a bride from the moor house i was sir 
and saw her then for the first time yes sir how did she look and act that first day i thought her the gayest bride i had ever seen then i thought her the saddest and then i did not know what to think she was so merry one minute and so frightened the next so full of talk when she came running up the steps and so struck with silence the minute she got into the parlour that i set her down as a queer one till some one whispered in my ear that she was suffering from a dreadful shock that ill luck had attended her marriage and much more about what had happened from time to time at the moor house and you believed what was told you believed believed it well enough to keep a watch on your young mistress to see if she were happy or not oh sir it was but natural the coroner suavely observed every one felt interested in this marriage you watched her of course now what was the result did you consider her well and happy the girl's voice sank and she cast a glance at her master which he did not lift his head to meet i did not think her happy she laughed and sang and was always in and out of the rooms like a butterfly but she did not wear a happy look except now and then when she was seated with mr jeffrey alone then i have seen her flush in a way to make the heart ache it was such a contrast sir to other times when she was by herself or or what or just with her sister sir the defiance with which this was said added point to what otherwise might have been an unimportant admission those who had already scrutinized miss tuttle with the curiosity of an ill-defined suspicion now scrutinized her with a more palpable one and those who had hitherto seen nothing in this heavily veiled woman but the bereaved sister of an irresponsible suicide allowed their looks to dwell piercingly on that concealing veil as if they would be glad to penetrate its folds and read in those beautiful features the meaning of an illusion uttered with such a sting in the tone you refer to miss tuttle observed the coroner mrs jeffrey's sister yes sir the menace was gone from the voice now but no one could forget that it had been there miss tuttle lived in the house with her sister did she not yes sir till that sister died and was buried then she went away the coroner did not pursue this topic preferring to return to the former one so you say that mrs jeffrey showed uneasiness ever since her wedding day can you give me any instance of this mention i mean any conversations overheard by you which would show us just what you mean i don't like to repeat things i hear but if you say that i must i can remember once passing mr and mrs jeffrey in the hall just as he was saying you take it too much to heart i expected a happy honeymoon somehow we have failed that was all i heard sir but what made me remember his words was that she was dressed for some afternoon reception and looked so charming and so and so as if she ought to be happier just so now when was this how long before her death oh a week or so it was very soon after the wedding day and did matters seem to improve after that did she appear any better satisfied or more composed i think she endeavoured to but there was something on her mind something which she tried to laugh off 
something that annoyed mr jeffrey and worried miss tuttle something which caused a cloud in the house for all the dances and dinners and goings and comings i am sorry to speak of it but it was so something that showed an unsettled mind almost the glitter in her eye was not natural neither was the way she looked at her sister and sometimes at her husband did she talk much about the catastrophe which attended her wedding did her mind seem to run on that incessantly at first but afterwards not so much i think mr jeffrey frowned on that subject did he ever frown on her no sir not not when they were alone or with no one by but me he seemed to love her then very much what do you mean by that loretta that he lost patience with her when other people were present miss tuttle for instance yes sir he used to change very much when 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 miss tuttle came into the room changed towards his wife yes sir how he grew more distant much more distant got up quite fretfully from his seat if he were sitting beside her and took up some book or paper and miss tuttle she never seemed to notice but but she did not come in very often after this had happened once or twice i mean into the room upstairs where they used to sit loretta i regret to put this question but after your replies i owe it to the jury if not to the parties themselves to make miss tuttle's position in this household thoroughly understood do you think she was a welcome visitor in this house the girl pursed up her lips glanced at the lady and gentleman whose feelings she was supposed to pass comment on and seemed to lose heart then as they failed to respond to her look of appeal she strove to get the better of her sense of shame and with a somewhat injured air replied i can only repeat what i once heard said about this by mr jeffrey himself miss tuttle had just left the dining-room and mrs jeffrey was standing in one of her black moods with her hands on the top of her chair ready to go but forgetting to do so i was there but neither of them noticed me he was staring at her and she was looking down neither seemed at ease suddenly he spoke and asked why must cora remain with us she started and her look grew strange and frightened because i want her to she cried i cannot live without cora these words so different from what we were expecting caused a sensation in the room and consequently a stir as the noise of shifting feet and moving heads began to be heard in all directions miss tuttle's head drooped a little but francis jeffrey did not betray any sign of feeling or even of attention the coroner embarrassed perhaps by this exhibition of silent misery so near him hesitated a little before he put his next question loretta on the contrary had gathered courage with every word she spoke and now looked ready for anything it was mrs jeffrey then who clung most determinedly to her sister the coroner finally suggested i have told you what she said yet these sisters spent but little time together very little as little as two persons could who lived together in one house this statement which seemed such a contradiction to her former one increased the interest and much disappointment was covertly shown when the coroner veered off from this topic and brusquely inquired 
did you ever know mr and mrs jeffrey to have any open rupture the answer was a decided one yes on tuesday morning preceding her death they had a long and angry talk in their own room after which mrs jeffrey made no further effort to conceal her wretchedness indeed one may say she began to die from that hour mrs jeffrey's death had occurred on wednesday evening let us hear what you have to say about this quarrel and what happened after it the girl with a renewed flush cast a deprecatory look at the mass of faces before her and meeting on all sides but one look of intense and growing interest drew up her neat figure with a relieved air and began a story which i will proceed to transcribe for you in the fewest possible words End of chapter eleven part one chapter eleven part two of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter eleven part two tuesday morning's breakfast had been a silent one there had been a ball the night before at some great place on massachusetts avenue but no one spoke of it miss tuttle made some remark about a friend she had met there but as no one listened to her she soon stopped and in a little while left the table mr and mrs jeffrey sat on but neither said anything finally mr jeffrey rose and speaking in a voice hardly recognizable remarked that he had something to say to her and led the way to their room mrs jeffrey looked frightened as she followed him so frightened that it was evident that something very serious had occurred or was about to occur between them as nothing of this kind had ever happened before loretta could not help waiting about till mr jeffrey reappeared and when he did so and she saw no signs of relief in his face or manner she watched with the silly interest of a girl who had nothing else to occupy her mind to see if he would leave the house in such a mood and without making peace with his young bride to her surprise he did not go out at the usual time but went to miss tuttle's room where for a full half-hour he remained closeted with his sister-in-law talking in excited and unnatural tones then he went back for a few minutes to where he had left his wife in her own boudoir but he could not have had much to say to her this time for he presently came out again and ran hastily downstairs and out almost without stopping to catch up his hat as it was mary's business and not the witnesses to make mrs jeffrey's bed in the morning loretta could think of no excuse for approaching her mistress's room at this moment but later when letters came followed by various messages and some visitors she went more than a dozen times to mrs jeffrey's door she was not admitted nor were her appeals answered except by a sharp go away nor was miss tuttle received any better though she tried more than once to see her sister especially as night came on and the hour approached for mr jeffrey's return mrs jeffrey was simply determined to remain alone and when dinner-time arrived and no mr jeffrey she could be induced to open her door only wide enough to take in the cup of tea which miss tuttle insisted upon sending her the witness here confessed that she had been very much excited by these unusual proceedings and by the effect which they seemed to have on the lady just mentioned so she was ready to notice that mrs jeffrey's hand shook like that of an old and palsied woman when she reached out for the tray 
gladly would loretta have caught one glimpse of her face but it was hidden by the door nor did mrs jeffrey answer a single one of her questions she simply closed her door and kept it so till toward midnight when miss tuttle coming into the hall ordered the house to be closed for the night then the long shut door softly swung open but before any one could reach it it was again pulled to and locked the next day brought no relief miss tuttle who had changed greatly during this unhappy day and night succeeded no better than before in getting access to her sister nor could loretta gain the least word from her mistress till toward the latter part of the afternoon when that lady ringing her bell gave her first order a substantial dinner she cried and when loretta greatly relieved brought up the required meal she was astonished to find the door open and herself bidden to enter the sight which met her eyes staggered her from one end of the room to the other were signs of great nervous unrest and of terrible suffering the chairs were pushed into corners as if the wretched bride had tramped the floor in an agony of excitement curtains were torn and the piano cover was hanging half on and half off the open upright as if she had clutched at it to keep herself from falling on the floor beneath lay several pieces of broken china vases of whose value mrs jeffrey had often spoken but which jerked off with the cover had been left where they fell while immediately in front of the fireplace lay one of the rugs tossed into a heap as if she had rolled in it on the floor or used it to smother her cries of pain or anger so much for the state in which the witness found the boudoir the adjoining bedroom was not in much better case though it was evident that the bed itself had not been lain in since it was made up the day before at breakfast time by this token mrs jeffrey had not slept the night before or if she had lain her head anywhere it had been on the rug already spoken of these signs of extreme mental suffering so much more extreme than any loretta had ever before witnessed frightened her so that the tray shook in her hand as she set it down on the table among the countless objects mrs jeffrey always had about her the noise seemed to startle her mistress who had walked to the window after opening the door for she wheeled impetuously about and loretta saw her face it was as if a blight had passed over it once gay and animated beyond the power of any one to describe it had become in twenty-four hours a ghost's face with the glare of some awful resolve on it or so it would appear from the way loretta described it but such girls do not always see correctly and perhaps all that can be safely stated is that mrs jeffrey was unnaturally pale and had lost her butterfly-like way of incessant movement loretta who was evidently accustomed to seeing her mistress arrayed in brilliant colours and much begemmed laid great stress on the fact that though it was on the verge of evening and she was evidently going out she was dressed in black cloth and without even a diamond or a flower to relieve its severe simplicity her hair too which was always her pride was piled in a careless mass upon her head as if she had tried to arrange it herself and had forgotten what she was doing while her fingers were but half through their work there was a cloak lying on a chair near which she was standing and she held a hat in her hand but loretta saw no gloves as the maid's glance and that of her mistress crossed mrs jeffrey spoke 
and the effort she made in doing so naturally frightened the girl still more i am going out were her words i may not be home till late what are you looking at loretta declared that the words took her by surprise and that she did not know what to say but managed to cover up her embarrassment by intimating that if her mistress would let her touch up her hair a bit she would make her look more natural at this suggestion mrs jeffrey cast a glance in the glass and impetuously declared it doesn't matter but she seemed to think better of it the next minute for throwing herself in a chair she bade the girl to bring a comb and sat quiet enough though evidently in a great tremor of haste and impatience while loretta combed her hair and put it up in the old way but the old way was not as becoming as usual and loretta was wondering if she ought to call in miss tuttle when mrs jeffrey jumped to her feet and went over to the table and began to eat with the feverish haste of one who forces himself to take food in spite of hurry and distaste this was the moment for loretta to leave the room but she did not know how to do so she felt herself fixed to the spot and stood watching mrs jeffrey till that lady suddenly becoming conscious of the girl's presence turned and in the midst of the moans which broke unconsciously from her lips said with a pitiable effort at her old manner go away loretta i am ill i have been ill for two days i don't like people to look at me like that then as the girl shrank back added in a breaking voice when mr jeffrey comes home and said no more for several minutes during which she clutched her throat with both hands and struggled with herself till she got her voice back and found herself able to repeat when mr jeffrey comes if he does come tell him that i was right about the way that novel ended remember that you are to say to him the moment you see him that i was right about the novel and that he is to look and see if it did not end as i said it would and loretta here she rose and approached the speaker with a sweet appealing look which brought tears to the impressionable girl's eyes don't go gossiping about me downstairs i shan't be sick long i am going to be better soon very soon by the time you see me here again i shall be quite like my old self forget how how and loretta said she seemed to have difficulty in finding the right word here how childish i have been of course loretta promised but she is not sure that she would have had the courage to keep all this to herself if she had not heard mrs jeffrey stop in miss tuttle's room on her way out that relieved her and enabled her to go downstairs to her own supper with more appetite than she had thought ever to have again alas it was the last good meal she was able to eat for days in three hours afterward a man came from the station-house with the news of mrs jeffrey's suicide in the horrible old house in which she had been married only two weeks before as this had been a continuous narrative and concisively told the coroner had not interrupted her when at this point a little gasp escaped miss tuttle and a groan broke from francis jeffrey's hitherto sealed lips the feelings of the whole assemblage seemed to find utterance a young wife's misery culminating in death on the very spot where she had been so lately married what could be more thrilling or appeal more closely to the general heart of humanity but the cause of that misery this was what every one present was eager to have explained this is what we now expected the coroner to bring out but instead of continuing on the line he had opened up he proceeded to ask 
where were you when this officer brought the news you mention in the hall sir i opened the door for him and to whom did he first mention his errand to miss tuttle she had come in just before him and was standing at the foot of the stairs what was miss tuttle out that evening yes she went out very soon after mrs jeffrey left when she came in she said that she had been around the block but she must have gone around it more than once for she was absent two hours did you let her in yes sir and she said she had been around the block yes sir did she say anything else she asked if mr jeffrey had come in anything else then if mrs jeffrey had returned on both of which questions you answered a plain no now tell us about the officer he rang the bell almost immediately after she did thinking she would want to slip upstairs before i admitted any one i waited a minute for her to go but she did not do so and when the officer stepped in she well she shrieked what before he spoke yes sir just at the sight of him yes sir did he wear his badge in plain view yes on his breast so that you knew him to be a police officer yes and miss tuttle shrieked at seeing a police officer yes and sprang forward did she say anything not then what did she do waited for him to speak which he did at once and very brutally he asked if she was mrs jeffrey's sister and when she nodded and gasped yes he blurted out that mrs jeffrey was dead that he had just come from the old house in waverley avenue where she had just been found and miss tuttle didn't know what to say just hid her face she was leaning against the newel post so it was easy for her to do so i remember that the man stared at her for taking it so quietly and asking no questions and did she speak at all oh yes afterwards her face was wrapped in the folds of her cloak but i heard her whisper as if to herself no no that old hearth is not a lodestone she cannot have fallen there and then she looked up quite wildly and cried there is something more something which you have not told me she shot herself if that's what you mean miss tuttle's arms went straight up over her head it was awful to see her shot herself she gasped oh veronica veronica with a pistol he went on i suppose he was going to say tied to her wrist but he never got it out for miss tuttle at the word pistol clapped her hands to her ears and for a moment looked quite distracted so that he thought better of worrying her any more and only demanded to know if mr jeffrey kept any such weapon miss tuttle's face grew very strange at this mr jeffrey was he there she asked the man looked surprised they are searching for mr jeffrey he replied isn't he here no came both from her lips and mine the man acted very impertinently you haven't told me whether a pistol was kept here or not said he miss tuttle tried to compose herself but i saw that i should have to speak if any one did so i told him that mr jeffrey did have a pistol which he kept in one of his bureau drawers but when the officer wanted miss tuttle to go up and see if it was there she shook her head and made for the front door saying that she must be taken directly to her sister and did no one go up was no attempt made to see if the pistol was or was not in the drawer 
yes the officer went up with me i pointed out the place where it was kept and he rummaged all through it but found no pistol i didn't expect him to here the witness paused and bit her lip adding confusedly mrs jeffrey had taken it you see the jurors who sat very much in the shadow had up to this point attracted but little attention but now they began to make their presence felt perhaps because the break in the witness's words had been accompanied by a sly look at jinny possibly warned by this that something lay back of this hitherto timid witness's sudden volubility one of them now spoke up in what room did you say this pistol was kept in mr and mrs jeffrey's bedroom sir the room opening out of the sitting-room where mrs jeffrey had kept herself shut up all day does this bedroom of which you speak communicate with the halls as well as with the sitting-room no sir it is the defect of the house mr and mrs jeffrey often spoke of it as a great annoyance you had to pass through the little boudoir in order to reach it the juryman sank back evidently satisfied with her replies but we who marked the visible excitement with which the witness had answered this seemingly unimportant question wondered what special interest surrounded that room and the pistol to warrant the heightened colour with which the girl answered this new interlocutor we were not destined to know at this time for the coroner when he spoke again pursued a different subject how long was this before mr jeffrey came in only a few minutes i was terribly frightened at being left there alone and was on my way to ask one of the other girls to come up and stay with me when i heard his key in the lock and came back he had entered the house and was standing near the door talking to an officer who had evidently come in with him it was a different officer from the one who had gone away with miss tuttle mr jeffrey was saying what's that my wife hurt dead sir blurted out the man i had expected to see mr jeffrey terribly shocked but not in so awful a way it certainly frightened me to see him and i turned to run but found that i couldn't and that i had to stand still and look whether i wanted or not yet he didn't say a word or ask a question what did he do loretta i cannot say he was on his knees and was white oh how white yet he looked up when the man described how and where mrs jeffrey had been found and even turned toward me when i said something about his wife having left a message for him when she went out this message which i almost hesitated to give after the awful news of her death was about the ending of some story as you remember and it seemed heartless to speak of it at a moment like this but as she had told me to i didn't dare to disobey her so with the man listening to my every word and mr jeffrey looking as if he would fall to the ground before i could finish i repeated her words to him and was surprised enough when he suddenly started upright and went flying upstairs but i was more surprised yet when at the top of the first flight he stopped and looking over the balustrade asked in a very strange voice where miss tuttle was for he seemed just then to want her more than anything else in the world and looked beaten and wild when i told him that she was already gone to waverley avenue but he recovered himself before the man could draw near enough to see his face and rushed into the sitting-room above and shut the door behind him leaving the officer and me standing down by the front door as i didn't know what to say to a man like him and he didn't know what to say to me the time seemed long 
but it couldn't have been very many minutes before mr jeffrey came back with a slip of paper in his hand and a very much relieved look on his face the deed was premeditated he cried my unfortunate wife has misunderstood my affection for her and from being a very much broken-down man he stood up straight and tall and prepared himself very quietly to go to the moore house that is all i can tell about the way the news was received by him were these details necessary many appeared to regard them as futile and uncalled for but coroner z was never known to waste time on trivialities and if he called for these facts those who knew him best were certain that they were meant as a preparation for mr jeffrey's testimony which was now called for End of chapter eleven part two chapter twelve of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter twelve thrust and parry when francis jeffrey's hand fell from his forehead and he turned to face the assembled people an instinctive compassion arose in every breast at sight of his face which if not open in its expression was at least surcharged with the deepest misery in a flash the scene took on new meaning many remembered that less than a month before his eye had been joyous and his figure a conspicuous one among the favoured sons of fortune and now he stood in sight of a crowd drawn together mainly by curiosity to explain as best he might why this great happiness and hope had come to a sudden termination and his bride of a fortnight had sought death rather than continue to live under the same roof with him so much for what i saw on the faces about me what my own face revealed i cannot say i only know that i strove to preserve an impassive exterior if i secretly held this man's misery to be a mask hiding untold passions and the darkness of an unimaginable deed it was not for me to disclose in this presence either my suspicions or my fears to me as to those about me he apparently was a man who at some sacrifice to his pride would yet be able to explain whatever seemed dubious in the mysterious case in which he had become involved his wife's uncle who to all appearances shared the general curiosity as to the effect which this woeful tragedy had had upon his niece's most interested survivor eyed with a certain cold interest eminently in keeping with his general character the pallid forehead sunken eyes and nervously trembling lip of the once handsome geoffrey till that gentleman rousing from his depression manifested a realization of what was required of higher and turned with a bow towards the coroner miss tuttle settled into a greater rigidity i pass over the preliminary examination of this important witness and proceed at once to the point when the coroner holding out the two or three lines of writing which mr jeffrey had declared to have been left him by his wife asked are these words in your wife's handwriting mr jeffrey replied hastily and with just a glance at the paper offered him they are the coroner pressed the slip upon him look at them carefully he urged the handwriting shows hurry and in places is scarcely legible 
are you ready to swear that these words were written by your wife and by no other mr jeffrey with just a slight contraction of his brow expressive of annoyance did as he was bid he scanned or appeared to scan the small scrap of paper which he now took in his own hand it is my wife's writing he impatiently declared written as all can see under great agitation of mind but hers without any doubt will you read aloud these words for our benefit asked the coroner it was a cruel request causing an instinctive protest from the spectators but no protest disturbed coroner z he had his reasons no doubt for thus trying the witness and when coroner z had reasons for anything it took more than the displeasure of the crowd to deter him mr jeffrey who had subdued whatever indignation he may have felt at this unmistakable proof of the coroner's intention to have his own way with him whatever the cost to his sensitiveness or pride obeyed the letter's command in firmer tones than i expected the lines he was thus called upon to read may bear repetition i find that i do not love you as i thought i cannot live knowing this to be so pray god you may forgive me veronica as the last word fell with a little tremble from mr jeffrey's lips the coroner repeated you still think these words were addressed to you by your wife that in short they contain an explanation of her death i do there was a sharpness in the tone mr jeffrey was feeling the prick there was agitation in it too an agitation he was trying hard to keep down you have reason then persisted the coroner for accepting this peculiar explanation of your wife's death a death which in the judgment of most people was of a nature to call for the strongest provocation possible my wife was not herself my wife was in an overstrained and suffering condition for one so nervously overwrought many allowances must be made she may have been conscious of not responding fully to my affection that this feeling was strong enough to induce her to take her life is a source of unspeakable grief to me but one for which you must find explanation as i have so often said in the terrors caused by the dread event at the moor house which recalled old tragedies and emphasized a most unhappy family tradition the coroner paused a moment to let these words sink into the ears of the jury then plunged immediately into what might be called the offensive part of his examination why if your wife's death caused you such intense grief did you appear so relieved at receiving this by no means consoling explanation at an implication so unmistakably suggestive of suspicion mr jeffrey showed fire for the first time whose words have you for that a servant's so newly come into my house that her very features are still strange to me you must acknowledge that a person of such marked inexperience can hardly be thought to know me or to interpret rightly the feelings of my heart by any passing look she may have surprised upon my face this attitude of defiance so suddenly assumed had an effect he little realized miss tuttle stirred for the first time behind her veil and uncle david from looking bored became suddenly quite attentive these two but mirrored the feelings of the general crowd and mine especially 
we do not depend on her judgment alone the coroner now remarked the change in you was apparent to many others this we can prove to the jury if they require it but no man lifting a voice from that gravely attentive body the coroner proceeded to inquire if mr jeffrey felt like volunteering any explanations on this head receiving no answer from him either he dropped the suggestive line of inquiry and took up the consideration of facts the first question he now put was where did you find the slip of paper containing these last words from your wife in a book i picked out of the bookshelf in our room upstairs when loretta gave me my wife's message i knew that i should find some word from her in the novel we had just been reading as we had been interested in but one book since our marriage there was no possibility of my making a mistake as to which one she referred will you give us the name of this novel compensation and you found this book called compensation in your room upstairs yes on the bookshelf yes where does this bookshelf stand mr jeffrey looked up as much as to say why so many small questions about so simple a matter but answered frankly enough at the right of the door leading into the bedroom and at right angles to the door leading into the hall yes very good now may i ask you to describe the cover of this book the cover i never noticed the cover why do you excuse me i suppose you have your reasons for asking even these puerile and seemingly unnecessary questions the cover is a queer one i believe partly red and partly green and that is all i know about it is this the book mr jeffrey glanced at the volume the coroner held up before him i believe so it looks like it the book had a flaming cover quite unmistakable in its character the title shows it to be the same remarked the coroner is this the only book with a cover of this kind in the house the only one i should say the coroner laid down the book enough of this then for the present only let the jury remember that the cover of this book is peculiar and that it was kept on a shelf at the right of the opening leading into the adjoining bedroom and now mr jeffrey we must ask you to look at these rings or rather at this one you have seen it before it is the one you placed on mrs jeffrey's hand when you were married to her a little over a fortnight ago you recognize it i do do you also recognize this small mark of blood on it as having been there when it was shown to you by the detective on your return from seeing her dead body at the moore house i do yes how do you account for that spot and the slight injury made to her finger should you not say that the ring had been dragged from her hand i should by whom was it dragged by you no sir by herself then it would seem so much passion must have been in that act do you think that any ordinary quarrel between husband and wife would account for the display of such fury are we not right in supposing a deeper cause for the disturbance between you than the slight one you offer in way of explanation an inaudible answer then a sudden straightening of francis jeffrey's fine figure and that was all mr jeffrey in the talk you had with your wife on tuesday morning was miss tuttle's name introduced 
it was mentioned yes sir with recrimination or any display of passion on the part of your wife you would not believe me if i said no was the unexpected rejoinder the coroner taken aback by this direct attack from one who had hitherto borne all his innuendos with apparent patience lost countenance for a moment but remembering that in his official capacity he was more than a match for the elegant gentleman who under other circumstances would have found it only too easy to put him to the blush he observed with dignity mr jeffrey you are on oath we certainly have no reason for not believing you mr jeffrey bowed he was probably sorry for his momentary loss of self-control and gravely but with eyes bent downward answered with the abrupt phrase well then i will say no the coroner shifted his ground will you make the same reply when i ask if the same forbearance was shown towards your wife's name in the conversation you had with miss tuttle immediately afterward a halt in the eagerly looked-for reply a hesitation momentarily indeed but pregnant with nameless suggestions caused his answer when it did come to lose some of the emphasis he manifestly wished to put into it miss tuttle was mrs jeffrey's half-sister the bond between them was strong would she would i be apt to speak of my young wife with bitterness that is not an answer to my question mr jeffrey i must request a more positive reply miss tuttle made a move the strain on all present was so great we could but notice it he noticed it too for his brows came together with a quick frown as he emphatically replied there were no recriminations uttered mrs jeffrey had displeased me and i said so but i did not forget that i was speaking of my wife and to her sister as this was in the highest degree non-committal the coroner could be excused for persisting the conversation then was about your wife it was in criticism of her conduct yes at the ambassador's ball yes mr jeffrey was a poor hand at lying that last yes came with a great effort the coroner waited possibly for the echo of this last yes to cease then he remarked with a coldness which lifted at once the veil from his hitherto well-disguised antagonism to his witness if you will recount to us anything which your wife said or did on that evening which in your mind was worthy of all this coil it might help us to understand the situation but the witness made no attempt to do so and while many of us were ready to pardon him this show of delicacy others felt that under the circumstances it would have been better had he been more open among the latter was the coroner himself who from this moment threw aside all hesitation and urged forward his inquiries in a way to press the witness closer and closer towards the net he was secretly holding out for him first he obliged him to say that his conversation with miss tuttle had not tended to smooth matters that no reconciliation with his wife had followed it and that in the thirty-six hours which elapsed before he returned home again he had made no attempt to soothe the feelings of one who according to his own story he considered hardly responsible for any extravagance in which she might have indulged 
then when this inconsistency had been given time to sink into the minds of the jury coroner z increased the effect produced by confronting jeffrey with witnesses who testified to the friendly if not lover-like relations which had existed between himself and miss tuttle prior to the appearance of his wife upon the scene closing with a question which brought out the denial by no means new that an engagement had ever taken place between him and miss tuttle and hence that a bond had been cancelled by his marriage with miss moore but his manner and careful choice of words in making this denial did not satisfy those present of his entire candour especially as miss tuttle for all her apparent immobility showed by the violent looking of her hands both her anxiety and the suffering she was undergoing during this painful examination was the suffering merely one of outraged delicacy we felt justified in doubting it and looked forward with cruel curiosity i admit to the moment when this renowned and universally admired beauty would be called on to throw aside her veil and reveal the highly praised features which had been so openly scorned for the sake of one whose chief claims to regard lay in her great wealth but this moment was as yet far distant the coroner was a man of method and his plan was now to prove as had been apparent to most of us from the first that the assumption of suicide on the part of mrs jeffrey was open to doubt the communication suggesting such an end to her troubles was the strongest proof mr jeffrey could bring forward that her death had been the result of her own act consequently it was now the coroner's business to show that this communication was either a forgery or a substitution and that if she left some words in the book to which she had in so peculiar a manner directed his attention it was not necessarily the one bewailing her absence of love for him and her consequent intention of seeking relief from her disappointment in death some hint of what the coroner contemplated had already escaped him in the persistent and seemingly inconsequent questions to which he had subjected this witness in reference to the very matters but the time had now come for a more direct attack and the interest rose correspondingly high when the coroner lifting again to sight the scrap of paper containing the few piteous lines so often quoted asked of the now anxious and agitated witness if he had ever noticed any similarity between the handwriting of his wife and that of miss tuttle an indignant no was about to pass his lips when he suddenly checked himself and said more mildly there may have been a similarity i hardly know i have seen too little of miss tuttle's hand to judge this occasioned a diversion specimens of miss tuttle's handwriting were produced which after having been duly proved were passed down to the jury along with the communication professedly signed by mrs jeffrey the grunts of astonishment which ensued as the knowing heads drew near over these several papers caused mr jeffrey to flush and finally to cry out with startling emphasis i know that those words were written by my wife but when the coroner asked him his reasons for this conviction he could or would not state them i have said he stolidly repeated and that was all 
the coroner made no comment but when after some further inquiry which added little to the general knowledge he dismissed mr jeffrey and recalled loretta there was that in his tone which warned us that the really serious portion of the day's examination was about to begin End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter thirteen chiefly thrust the appearance of this witness had undergone a change since she last stood before us she was shamefaced still but her manner showed resolve and a feverish determination to face the situation which could but awaken in the breasts of those who had mr jeffrey's honour and personal welfare at heart a nameless dread as if they already foresaw the dark shadow which minute by minute was slowly sinking over a household which up to a week ago had been the envy and admiration of all washington society the first answer she made revealed both the cause of her shame and the reason of her firmness it was in response to the question whether she loretta had seen miss tuttle before she went out on the walk she was said to have taken immediately after mrs jeffrey's final departure from the house her words were these i did sir i do not think miss tuttle knows it but i saw her in mrs jeffrey's room the emphatic tone offering such a contrast to her former manner of speech might have drawn all eyes to the speaker had not the person she mentioned offered a still more interesting subject to the general curiosity as it was all glances flew to that silent and seemingly impassive figure upon which all open suggestions and covert innuendo had hitherto fallen without creating more than a pressure of her interlaced fingers this direct attack possibly the most threatening she had received appeared to produce no more effect upon her than the others less perhaps for no stir was visible in her now and to some eyes she hardly seemed to breathe curiosity thus baffled led the gaze on to mr jeffrey and even to uncle david but the former had dropped his head again upon his hand and the other well there was little to observe in mr moore at any time save the immense satisfaction he seemed to take in himself so attention returned to the witness who by this time had entered upon a consecutive tale as near as i can remember these are the words with which she prefaced it i am not especially proud of what i did that night but i was led into it by degrees and i am sure i beg the lady's pardon and then she went on to relate how after she had seen mrs jeffrey leave the house she went into her room with the intention of putting it to rights as this was no more than her duty no fault could be found with her but she owned that when she had finished this task and removed all evidence of mrs jeffrey's frenzied condition she had no business to linger at the table turning over the letters she found lying there here the coroner stopped her and made some inquiries in regard to these letters but as they seemed to be ordinary epistles from friends and quite foreign to the investigation he allowed her to proceed 
her cheeks were burning now for she had found herself obliged to admit that she had read enough of these letters to be sure that they had no reference to the quarrel then pending between her mistress and mr jeffrey her eyes fell and she looked seriously distressed as she went on to say that she was as conscious then as now of having no business with these papers so conscious indeed that when she heard miss tuttle's step at the door her one idea was to hide herself that she could stand and face that lady never so much as occurred to her her own guilty consciousness made her cheeks too hot for her to wish to meet an eye which had never rested on her any too kindly so noticing how straight the curtains fell over one of the windows on the opposite side of the room she dashed towards it and slipped in out of sight just as miss tuttle came in this window was one seldom used owing to the fact that it overlooked an adjoining wall so she had no fear of miss tuttle's approaching it consequently she could stand there quite at her ease and as the curtains in falling behind her had not come quite together she really could not help seeing just what that lady did here the witness paused with every appearance of looking for some token of disapprobation from the crowd but she encountered nothing there but eager anxiety for her to proceed so without waiting for the coroner's question she added in so many words she went first to the bookshelves we had expected it but yet a general movement took place and a few suppressed exclamations could be heard and what did she do there took down a book after looking carefully up and down the shelves what colour of book a green one with red figures on it i could see the cover plainly as she took it down like this one exactly like that one and what did she do with this book opened it but not to read it she was too quick in closing it for that did she take the book away no she put it back on the shelf after opening and closing it yes sir did you see whether she put anything into the book i cannot swear that she did but then her back was to me and i could not have seen it if she had the implied suggestion caused some excitement but the coroner frowning on this pressed the girl to continue asking if miss tuttle left the room immediately after turning from the bookshelves loretta replied no that on the contrary she stood for some minutes near them gazing in what seemed like a great distress of mind straight upon the floor after which she moved in an agitated way and with more than one anxious look behind her into the adjoining room where she paused before a large bureau as this bureau was devoted entirely to mr jeffrey's use loretta experienced some surprise at seeing his wife's sister approach it in so stealthy a manner consequently she was watching with all her might when this young lady opened the upper drawer and with very evident emotion thrust her hand into it what she took out or whether she took out anything this spy upon her movements could not say for when loretta heard the drawer being pushed back into place she drew the curtains close perceiving that miss tuttle would have to face this window in coming back however she ventured upon one other peep through them just as that lady was leaving the room 
and remembered as if it were yesterday how clay white her face looked and how she held her left hand pressed close against the folds of her dress it was but a few minutes after this that miss tuttle left the house as we all knew what was kept in that drawer the conclusion was obvious whatever excuse miss tuttle might give for going into her sister's room at this time but one thought one fear or possibly one hope could have taken her to mr jeffrey's private drawer she wished to see if his pistol was still there or if it had been taken away by her sister a revelation of the extreme point to which her thoughts had flown at this crisis and one which effectually contradicted her former statement that she had been conscious of no alarm in behalf of her sister and had seen her leave the house without dread or suspicion of evil the temerity which had made it possible to associate the name of such a man as francis jeffrey with an outrageous crime having been thus in a measure explained the coroner recalled that gentleman and again thoroughly surprised the gaping public had the witness accompanied his wife to the moore house no had he met her there by any appointment he had made with her or which had been made for them both by some third person no had he been at the moore house on the night of the eleventh at any time previous to the hour when he was brought there by the officials no would he glance at this impression of certain finger-tips which had been left in the dust of the southwest chamber mantel he had already noted them now would he place his left hand on the paper and see it is not necessary he burst forth in great heat i own to those marks that is i have no doubt they were made by my hand here unconsciously his eyes flew to the member thus referred to as if conscious that in some way he had proved a traitor to him after which his gaze travelled slowly my way with an indescribable question in it which roused my conscience and made the trick by which i had got the impression of his hand seem less of a triumph than i had heretofore considered it the next minute he was answering the coroner under oath very much as he had answered him in the unofficial interview at which i had been present i acknowledge having been in the moore house and even having been in the southwest chamber but not at the time supposed it was on the previous night he went on to relate how being in a nervous condition and having the key to this old dwelling in his pocket he had amused himself by going through its dilapidated interior all of this made a doubtful impression which was greatly emphasized when in reply to the inquiry as to where he got the light to see by he admitted that he had come upon a candle in an upstairs room and made use of that though he could not remember what he had done with this candle afterward and looked dazed and quite at sea till the coroner suggested that he might have carried it into the closet of the room where his fingers had left their impression in the dust of the mantel-shelf then he broke down like a man from whom some prop is suddenly snatched and looked around for a seat this was given him while a silence the most dreadful i ever experienced held every one there in check but he speedily rallied and with the remark that he was a little confused in regard to the incidents of that night waited with a vivid look in his averted eye for the coroner's next question 
unhappily for him it was in continuation of the same subject had he bought candles or not at the grocer's around the corner yes he had before visiting the house yes had he also bought matches yes what kind common safety matches had he noticed when he got home that the box he had just bought was half empty no nevertheless he had used many matches in going through this old house had he not possibly to light his way upstairs perhaps it might be had he not so used them yes why had he done so if he had candles in his pocket which were so much easier to hold and so much more lasting than a lighted match ah uh, he could not say he did not know his mind was confused he was awake when he should have been asleep it was all a dream to him the coroner became still more persistent did you enter the library on your solitary visit to this old house i believe so what did you do there pottered around i don't remember what light did you use a candle i think you must know well i had a candle it was in a candelabrum what candle and what candelabrum the same i used upstairs of course and you cannot remember where you left this candle and candelabrum when you finally quitted the house no i wasn't thinking about candles what were you thinking about the rupture with my wife and the bad name of the house i was in oh and this was on tuesday night yes sir how can you prove this to us i cannot but you swear i swear that it was tuesday night the night immediately preceding the one when when my wife's death robbed me of all earthly happiness it was feelingly uttered and several faces lightened but the coroner repeating is there no way you can prove this to our satisfaction the shadow settled again and on no head more perceptibly than on that of the unfortunate witness it was now late in the day and the atmosphere of the room had become stifling but no one seemed to be conscious of any discomfort and a general gasp of excitement passed through the room when the coroner taking out a box from under a pile of papers disclosed to the general gaze the famous white ribbon with its dainty bow lying on top of the fatal pistol that this special feature the most interesting one of all connected with this tragedy should have been kept so long in reserve and brought out just at this time struck many of mr jeffrey's closest friends as unnecessarily dramatic but when the coroner lifting out the ribbon remarked tentatively you know this ribbon we were more struck by the involuntary cry of surprise which rose from some one in the crowd about the door than by the look with which mr jeffrey eyed it and made the necessary reply that cry had something more than nervous excitement in it identifying the person who had uttered it as a certain busy little woman well known in town i sent an officer to watch her then recalled my attention to the point the coroner was attempting to make he had forced mr jeffrey to recognize the ribbon as the one which had fastened the pistol to his wife's arm 
now he asked whether in his opinion a woman could tie such a bow to her own wrist and when in common justice mr jeffrey was obliged to say no waited a third time before he put the general suspicion again into words cannot you by some means or some witness prove to us that it was on tuesday night and not on wednesday you spent the hours you speak of on this scene of your marriage and your wife's death the hopelessness which more than once had marked mr jeffrey's features since the beginning of this inquiry reappeared with renewed force as this suggestive question fell again upon his ears and he was about to repeat his plea of forgetfulness when the coroner's attention was diverted by a request made in his ear by one of the detectives in another moment mr jeffrey had been waved aside and a new witness sworn in you can imagine every one's surprise mine most of all when this witness proved to be uncle david end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the filigree ball by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter fourteen tall man let us have tall man i do not know why the coroner had so long delayed to call this witness in the ordinary course of events his testimony should have preceded mine but the ordinary course of events had not been followed and it was only at the request of mr moore himself that he was now allowed the privilege of appearing before this coroner and jury i speak of it as a privilege because he himself evidently regarded it as such indeed his whole attitude and bearing as he addressed himself to the coroner showed that he was there to be looked at and that he secretly thought he was very well worth this attention possibly some remembrance of the old days in which he had gone in and out before these people in a garb suggested of penury made the moment when he could appear before them in a guise more befitting his station one of incalculable importance to him at all events he confronted us all with an aspect which openly challenged admiration when in answer to the coroner's inquiries it became his duty to speak he did so with a condescension which would have called up smiles if the occasion had been one of less seriousness and his connection with it as unimportant as he would have it appear what he said was in the way of confirming the last witness's testimony as to his having been at the moore house on tuesday evening mr moore who was very particular as to dates and days admitted that the light which he had seen in a certain window of his ancestral home on the evening when he summoned the police was but the repetition of one he had detected there the evening before it was this repetition which alarmed him and caused him to break through all his usual habits and leave his home at night to notify the police the old sneak thought i why didn't he tell us this before and i allowed myself a fresh doubt of his candour which had always seemed to me somewhat open to question it is possible that the coroner shared my opinion or that he felt it incumbent upon him to get what evidence he could from the sole person living within view of the house in which such ghastly events had taken place 
for without betraying the least suspicion and yet with the quiet persistence for which men in his responsible position are noted he subjected this suave old man to such a rigid examination as to what he had seen or had not seen from his windows that no possibility seemed to remain of his concealing a single fact which could help to the elucidation of this or any other mystery connected with the old mansion he asked him if he had seen mr jeffrey go in on the night in question if he had ever seen any one go in there since the wedding or even if he had seen any one loitering about the steps or sneaking into the rear yard but the answer was always no these same no's growing more and more emphatic and the gentleman more and more impenetrable and dignified as the examination went on in fact he was as unassailable a witness as i have ever heard testify before any jury beyond the fact already mentioned of his having observed a light in the opposite house on the two evenings in question he admitted nothing his life in the little cottage was so engrossing he had his organ his dog why should he look out of the window had it not been for his usual habit of letting his dog run the pavements for a quarter of an hour before finally locking up for the night he would not have seen as much as he did have you any stated hour for doing this the coroner now asked yes half past nine and was this the hour when you saw that light yes both times as he had appeared at the station-house at a few minutes before ten he was probably correct in his statement but notwithstanding this i did not feel implicit confidence in him he was too insistent in his regret at not being able to give greater assistance in the disentanglement of a mystery so affecting the honour of the family of which he was now the recognised head his voice nicely attuned to the occasion was admirable so was his manner but i mentally wrote him down as one i should enjoy outwitting if the opportunity ever came my way he wound up with such a distinct repetition of his former emphatic assertion as to the presence of light in the old house on tuesday as well as wednesday evening that mr jeffrey's testimony in this regard received a decided confirmation i looked to see some open recognition of this when suddenly and with a persistence understood only by the police the coroner recalled mr jeffrey and asked him what proof he had to offer that his visit of tuesday had not been repeated the next night and that he was not in the building when that fatal trigger was pulled at this leading question a lawyer sitting near me edged himself forward as if he hoped for some sign from mr jeffrey which would warrant him in interfering but mr jeffrey gave no such sign i doubt if he even noticed this man's proximity though he knew him well and had often employed him as his legal adviser in times gone by he was evidently exerting himself to recall the name which so persistently eluded his memory putting his hand to his head and showing the utmost confusion i cannot give you one he finally stammered there is a man who could tell if only i could remember his name suddenly with a loud cry which escaped him involuntarily he gave a gurgling laugh and we heard the name tall man leap from his lips the witness had at last remembered whom he had met at the cemetery gate at the hour 
or near the hour his wife lay dying in the lower part of the city the effect was electrical one of the spectators some country boor no doubt so far forgot himself as to cry out loud enough for all to hear tall man let us have tall man of course he met with an instant rebuke but i did not wait to hear it or to see the order restored for a glance from the coroner had already sent me to the door in search of this new witness my destination was the cosmos club for phil tallman and his habits and haunts were as well known in washington as the figure of liberty on the summit of the capitol dome when i saw him i did not wonder never have i seen a more amiable-looking man or one with a more absent-minded expression to my query as to whether he had ever met mr jeffrey at or near the entrance of rock creek cemetery he replied with an amazed look and the quick response of course i did it was the very night that his wife but what's up you look excited for a detective come to the morgue and see this testimony of yours will prove invaluable to mr jeffrey i shall never forget the murmur of suppressed excitement which greeted us as i reappeared before coroner and jury accompanied by the gentleman who had been called for in such peremptory tones a short time before mr jeffrey who had attempted to rise at our entrance but seemed to lack the ability gave a faint smile as tallman's good-natured face appeared and the coroner feeling perhaps that some cords are liable to break if stretched too strongly administered the oath and made the necessary inquiries with as little delay as was compatible with the solemnity of the occasion the result was an absolute proof that mr jeffrey had been near soldiers home as late as seven which was barely fifteen minutes previous to the hour mrs jeffrey's watch was stopped by her fall in the old house on waverley avenue as the distance between the two places could not be compassed in that time mr jeffrey's alibi could be regarded as established when we were all rising glad of an adjournment which restored free movement and an open interchange of speech a sudden check in the general rush called our attention back to mr jeffrey he was standing facing miss tuttle who was still sitting in a strangely immovable attitude in her old place he had just touched her on the arm and now with a look of alarm he threw up the veil which had kept her face hidden from all beholders a vision of loveliness greeted us but that was not all it was an unconscious loveliness miss tuttle had fainted away sitting upright in her chair End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen, Part One of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Fifteen, White Bow and Pink, Part One. Mister Jeffrey's examination and its triumphant conclusion created a great furor in town topics which had hitherto absorbed all minds were forgotten in the discussion of the daring attempt which had been made by the police to fix crime upon one of washington's most esteemed citizens and the check which they had rightly suffered for this outrage what might be expected next something equally bold and reprehensible of course but what it was a question which at the next sitting completely filled the inquest room 
to my great surprise mr jeffrey was recalled to the stand he had changed since the night before he looked older and while still handsome for nothing could rob him of his regularity of feature and extreme elegance of proportion showed little of the spirit which in spite of the previous day's depression had upheld him through its most trying ordeal and kept his eye bright if only from excitement this was fact number one and one which i stored away in my already well-furnished memory miss tuttle sat in a less conspicuous position than on the previous day and mr moore her uncle was not there at all the testimony called for received an old point which seemingly had not been settled to the coroner's satisfaction had mr jeffrey placed the small stand holding the candelabrum on the spot where it had been found no had he carried into the house at the time of his acknowledged visit the candles which had been afterwards discovered there no he had had time to think since his hesitating and unsatisfactory replies of the day before and he was now in a position to say that while he distinctly remembered buying candles on his way to the moore house he had not found them in his pocket on getting there and had been obliged to make use of the matches he had always carried on his person in order to find his way to the upstairs room where he felt positive he would find a candle this gave the coroner an opportunity to ask and why did you expect to find a candle there the answer astonished me and i have no doubt many others it was the room in which my wife had dressed for the ceremony it had not been disturbed since that time my wife had little ways of her own one was to complete her toilet by using a curling iron on a little lock she wore over her temple when at home she heated this curling iron in the gas jet but there being no gas in the moore house i naturally concluded that she had made use of a candle as the curl had been noticeable under her veil oh the weariness of his tone i could scarcely interpret it was he talking by rote or was he utterly done with life and all its interests no one besides myself seemed to note this strange passivity to the masses he was no longer a suffering man but an individual from whom information was to be got the next question was a vital one he had accounted for one candle in the house could he account for the one found in the tumbler or for the one lying crushed and battered on the closet floor he could not and now we all observed a change of direction in the inquiry witnesses were summoned to corroborate mr jeffrey's statements statements which it seemed to be the coroner's present wish to establish first came the grocer who had sold mr jeffrey the candles he acknowledged much to jinny's discomfort that an hour after mr jeffrey had left the store he had found on the counter the package which that gentleman had forgotten to take poor jenny had not stayed long enough to hear his story out the grocer finished his testimony by saying that immediately upon his discovery he had sent the candles to mr jeffrey's house this the coroner caused to be emphasized to such an extent that we were all convinced of its importance but as yet his purpose was not evident save to those who were more in his confidence than myself the other witnesses were men from rokers who had acted as waiters at the time of the marriage one of them testified that immediately on miss moore's arrival he had been sent for a candle and a box of matches 
the other that he had carried up to her room a large candelabrum from the drawing-room mantel a pair of curling tongs taken from the dressing-table of this room was next produced together with other articles of toilet use which had been allowed to remain there uncared for although they were of solid silver and of beautiful design the next witness was a member of mr jeffrey's own household chloe was her name and her good black face worked dolefully as she admitted that the package of candles which the grocer boy had left on the kitchen table with the rest of the groceries on the morning of that dreadful day when mrs killed herself was not to be found when she came to put the things away she had looked and looked for it but it was not there further inquiry brought out the fact that but one other member of the household was in the kitchen when the groceries were delivered and that this person gave a great start when the boy shouted out the candles there were bought by mr jeffrey and hurried over to the table and handled the packages although chloe did not see her carry any of them away and who was this person miss tuttle with the utterance of this name the veil fell from the coroner's intentions and the purpose of this petty but prolonged inquiry stood revealed it was to all a fearful and impressive moment to me it was as painful as it was triumphant i had not anticipated such an outcome when i put my wits to work to prove that murder and not suicide was answerable for young mrs jeffrey's death when the murmur which had hailed this startling turn in the inquiry had subsided the coroner drew a deep breath and with an uneasy glance at the jury who to a man seemed to wish themselves well out of this job he dismissed the cook and summoned a fresh witness her name made the people stare miss nixon miss nixon that was a name well known in washington almost as well known as that of uncle david or even of mr tallman what could this quaint and characteristic little buddy have to do with this case of doubtful suicide a word will explain she was the person who on the day before had made that loud exclamation when the box containing the ribbon and the pistol had been disclosed to the jury as her fussy little figure came forward some nudged and some laughed possibly because her bonnet was not of this year's style possibly because her manner was peculiar and as full of oddities as her attire but they did not laugh long for the little lady's look was appealing if not distressed the fact that she was generally known to possess one of the largest bank accounts in the district made any marked show of disrespect toward her a matter of poor judgment if not of questionable taste the box in the coroner's hand prepared us for what was before us as he opened it and disclosed again the dainty white bow which as i have before said was of rather a fantastic make the whole room full of eager spectators craned forward and were startled enough when he asked did you ever see a bow like this before her answer came in the faintest of tones yes i have one like it very like it so like it that yesterday i could not suppress an exclamation on seeing this one where did you get the one you have who fashioned it i mean or tied it for you if that is what i ought to say it was tied for me by miss tuttle 
she is a friend of mine or was and a very good one and one day while watching me struggling with a piece of ribbon which i wanted made into a bow she took it from my hand and tied a knot for which i was very much obliged to her it was very pretty and like this almost exactly sir have you that knot with you she had will you show it to the jury heaving a sigh which she had much better have suppressed she opened a little bag she carried at her side and took out a pink satin bow it had been tied by a deft hand and more than one pair of eyes fell significantly at sight of it amid a silence which was intense two or three other witnesses were called to prove that miss tuttle's skill in bow-tying was exceptional and was often made use of not only by members of her household but as in miss nixon's case by outsiders the special style shown in the one under consideration being the favourite during all this i kept my eyes on mr jeffrey it had now become so evident which way the coroner's inquiries tended that i wished to be the first to note their effect on him it was less marked than i had anticipated the man seemed benumbed by accumulated torment and stared at the witnesses filing before him as if they were part of some wild phantasmagoria which confused without enlightening him when finally several persons of both sexes were brought forward to prove that his attentions to miss tuttle had once been sufficiently marked for an announcement of their engagement to be daily looked for he let his head fall forward on his breast as if the creeping horror which had seized him was too much for his brain if not for his heart the final blow was struck when the man whom i had myself seen in alexandria testified to the contretemps which had occurred in atlantic city an additional point being given to it by the repetition of some old conversation raked up for the purpose by which an effort was made to prove that miss tuttle found it hard to forgive injuries even from those nearest and dearest to her this subject might have been prolonged but some of the jury objected and the time being now ripe for the great event of the day the name of the lady herself was called End of chapter fifteen part one Chapter Fifteen, Part Two of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Fifteen, Part Two. After so significant a preamble, the mere utterance of Miss Tuttle's name had almost the force of an accusation, but the dignity with which she rose calmed all minds and subdued every expression of feeling i could but marvel at her self-poisoned noble equanimity and asked myself if in the few days which had passed since first the murmur of something more serious than suicide had gone about she had so schooled herself for all emergencies that nothing could shake her self-possession not even the suggestion that a woman of her beauty and distinction could be concerned in a crime or had she within herself some great source of strength which sustained her in this most dreadful ordeal all were on watch to see when the veil dropped from before her features and she stepped into the full sight of the expectant crowd it was not the beauty of her face notable and conspicuous as it was which roused the hum of surprise which swept from one end of the room to the other but the calmness 
almost the elevation of her manner a calmness and elevation so unlooked for in the light of the strange conditions offered by the evidence to which we had been listening for a day and a half that all were affected many inclined even to believe her innocent of any undue connection with her sister's death before she had stretched forth her hand to take the oath i was no exception to the rest though i had exerted myself from the first to bring matters to a climax but not to this one i experienced such a shock under the steady gaze of her sad but gentle eyes that i found myself recoiling before my own presumption with something like secret shame till i was relieved by the thought that a perfectly innocent woman would show more feeling at so false and cruel a position i felt that only one with something to conceal would turn so calm a front upon men ready as she knew to fix upon her a great crime this conviction steadied me and made me less susceptible to her grace and to the tone of her quiet voice and the far-away sadness of her look she faltered only when by chance she glanced at the shrinking figure of francis jeffrey her name which she uttered without emphasis and yet in a way to arouse attention sank into all hearts with more or less disturbance alice cora tuttle how in days gone by and not so long gone by either those three words had aroused the enthusiasm of many a gallant man and inspired the toast at many a gallant feast they had their charm yet if the heightened colour observable on many a cheek there was a true index to the quickening heart below how are you connected with the deceased mrs jeffrey i am the child of her mother by a former husband we were half-sisters no bitterness in this statement only an infinite sadness the coroner continued to question her he asked for an account of her childhood and forced her to lay bare the nature of her relations with her sister but little was gained by this for their relations seemed to have been of a sympathetic character up to the time of veronica's return from school when they changed somewhat but how or why miss tuttle was naturally averse to saying indeed she almost refused to do so and the coroner feeling his point gained more by this refusal than by any admission she might have made did not press this subject but passed on to what interested us more the various unexplained actions on her part which pointed toward crime his first inquiry was in reference to the conversation held between her and mr jeffrey at the time he visited her room we had listened to his account of it and now we wished to hear hers but the cue which had been given her by this very account had been invaluable to her and her testimony naturally coincided with his we found ourselves not an inch advanced they had talked of her sister's follies and she had advised patience and that was all she could say on the subject all she would say as we presently saw the coroner introduced a fresh topic what can you tell us about the interview you had with your sister prior to her going out on the night of her death very little except that it differed entirely from what is generally supposed she did not come to my room for conversation but simply to tell me that she had an engagement she was in an excited mood but said nothing to alarm me she even laughed when she left me perhaps to put me off my guard perhaps because she was no longer responsible 
did she know that mr jeffrey had visited you earlier in the day did she make any allusion to it i mean none at all she shrugged her shoulders when i asked if she was well and anticipated all further questions by running from the room she was always capricious in her ways and never more so than at that moment would to god that it had been different would to god that she had shown herself to be a suffering woman then i might have reached her heart and this tragedy would have been averted the coroner favoured the witness with a look of respect perhaps because his next question must necessarily be cruel is that all you have to say concerning this important visit the last you held with your sister before her death no sir there is something else something which i should like to relate to this jury when she came into my room she held in her hand a white ribbon that is she held the two ends of a long satin ribbon which seemed to come from her pocket handing those two ends to me she asked me to tie them about her wrist a knot under and a bow on top she said so that it cannot slip off as this was something i had often been called on to do for her i showed no hesitation in complying with her request indeed i felt none i thought it was her fan or her bouquet she held concealed in the folds of her dress but it proved to be gentlemen you know what i pray that you will not oblige me to mention it it was such a stroke as no lawyer would have advised her to make i heard afterward that she had refused the offices of a dozen lawyers who had proffered her their services but uttered as it was with a noble air and a certain dignified serenity it had a great effect upon those about her and turned in a moment the wavering tide of favour in her direction the coroner who doubtless was perfectly acquainted with the explanation with which she had provided herself but who perhaps did not look for it to antedate his attack bowed in quiet acknowledgment of her request and then immediately proceeded to ignore it i should be glad to spare you he said but i do not find it possible you knew that mr jeffrey had a pistol i did that it was kept in their apartment yes in the upper drawer of a certain bureau yes now miss tuttle will you tell us why you went to that drawer if you did go to that drawer immediately after mrs jeffrey left the house she had probably felt this question coming not only since the coroner began to speak but ever since the evidence elicited from loretta proved that her visit to this drawer had been secretly observed yet she had no answer ready i did not go for the pistol she finally declared but she did not say what she had gone for and the coroner did not press her again the tide swung back she seemed to feel the change but did not show it in the way naturally looked for instead of growing perturbed or openly depressed she bloomed into greater beauty and confronted with steadier eye not us but the men she instinctively faced as the tide of her fortunes began to lower did the coroner perceive this and recognize at last both the measure of her attractions and the power they were likely to carry with them perhaps for his voice took an acrid tone as he declared you had another errand in that room she let her head droop just a trifle alas she murmured you went to the bookshelves and took out a book with a peculiar cover a cover which mr jeffrey has already recognized as that of the book in which he found a certain note 
you have said it she faltered did you take out such a book i did for what purpose miss tuttle she had meant to answer quickly but some consideration made her hesitate and the words were long in coming when she did speak it was to say my sister asked another favour of me after i had tied the ribbon pausing in her passage to the door she informed me in a tone quite in keeping with her whole manner that she had left a note for her husband in the book they were reading together her reason for doing this she said was the very natural one of wishing him to come upon it by chance but as she had placed it in the front of the book instead of in the back where they were reading she was afraid that he would fail to find it would i be so good as to take it out for her and insert it again somewhere near the end she was in a hurry or she would return to do it herself as she and mr jeffrey had parted in anger i hailed with joy this evidence of her desire for a reconciliation and it was in obedience to her request the singularity of which did not strike me as forcibly then as now that i went to the shelves in her room and took down the book and did you find the note where she said yes and put it in towards the end of the story nothing more did you read the note it was folded was miss tuttle's quiet answer certainly this woman was a thoroughbred or else she was an adept in deception such as few of us had ever encountered the gentleness of her manner the easy tone the quiet eyes eyes in whose dark depths great passions were visible but passions that were under the control of an equally forcible will made her a puzzle to all men's minds but it was a fascinating puzzle that awoke a species of awe in those who attempted to understand her to all appearances she was the unlikeliest woman possible to cherish criminal intents yet her answers were rather clever than convincing unless you allowed yourself to be swayed by the look of her beautiful face or the music of her rich sad voice you did not remain before these bookshelves long observed the coroner you have a witness who knows more about that than i do she suggested and doubtless aware of the temerity of this reply waited with unmoved countenance but with a visibly bounding breast for what would doubtless prove a fresh attack it was a violent one and of a character she was least fitted to meet taking up the box i have so often mentioned the coroner drew away the ribbon lying on top and disclosed the pistol in a moment her hands were over her ears why do you do that he asked did you think i was going to discharge it she smiled pitifully as she let her hands fall again i have a dread of firearms she explained i always have had now they are simply terrible to me and this one i understand said the coroner with a slight glance in the direction of durbin they had evidently planned this test together on the strength of an idea suggested to durbin by her former action when the memory of this shot was recalled to her your horror seems to lie in the direction of the noise they make continued her inexorable interlocutor one would say you had heard this pistol discharged instantly a complete breaking up of her hitherto well-maintained composure altered her whole aspect and she vehemently cried i did i did i was on waverley avenue that night and i heard the shot which in all probability ended my sister's life 
i walked further than i intended i strolled into the street which had such bitter memories for us and i heard no i was not in search of my sister i had not associated my sister's going out with any intention of visiting this house i was merely troubled in mind and anxious and and she had overrated her strength or her cleverness she found herself unable to finish the sentence and so did not try she had been led by the impulse of the moment farther than she had intended and aghast at her own imprudence paused with her first perceptible loss of courage before the yawning gulf opening before her i felt myself seized by a very uncomfortable dread lest her concealments and unfinished sentences hid a guiltier knowledge of this crime than i was yet ready to admit the coroner who is an older man than myself betrayed a certain satisfaction but no dread never did the unction which underlies his sharpest speeches show more plainly than when he quietly remarked and so under a similar impulse you as well as mr jeffrey chose this uncanny place to ramble in to all appearance that old hearth acted much more like a lodestone upon members of your family than you were willing at one time to acknowledge this reference to words she had herself been heard to use seemed to overwhelm her her calmness fled and she cast a fleeting look of anguish at mr jeffrey but his face was turned from sight and meeting with no help there or anywhere indeed save in her own powerful nature she recovered as best as she could the ground she had lost and with a trembling question of her own attempted to put the coroner in fault and re-establish herself you say ramble through do you for a moment think that i entered that old house miss tuttle was the grave almost sad reply did you not know that in some earth dropped from a flower-pot overturned at the time when a hundred guests flew in terror from this house there is to be seen the mark of a footstep a footstep which you are at liberty to measure with your own ah she murmured her hands going up to her face but in another moment she had dropped them and looked directly at the coroner i walked there i never said that i did not walk there when i went later to see my sister and in sight of a number of detectives passed straight through the halls and into the library and that this footstep inexorably proceeded the coroner is not in a line with the main thoroughfare extending from the front to the back of the house but turned inwards toward the wall as if she who made it had stopped to lean her head against the partition miss tuttle's head drooped probably she realized at this moment if not before that the coroner and jury had ample excuse for mistrusting one who had been so unmistakably caught in a prevarication possibly her regret carried her far enough to wish she had not disdained all legal advice from those who had so earnestly offered it but though she showed alike her shame and her disheartenment she did not give up the struggle if i went into the house she said it was not to enter that room i had too great a dread of it if i rested my head against the wall it was in terror of that shot it came so suddenly and was so frightful so much more frightful than anything you can conceive then you did enter the house i did and it was while you were inside instead of outside that you heard the shot 
i must admit that too i was at the library door you acknowledge that i do but you did not enter the library no not then not till i was taken back by the officer who told me of my sister's death we are glad to hear this precise statement from you it encourages me to ask again the nature of the freak which took you into this house you say that it was not from any dread on your sister's account what then was it no evasive answer will satisfy us miss tuttle she realized this as no one else could mr jeffrey's reason for his visit there could not be her reason yet what other had she to give apparently none i cannot answer she said and the deep sigh which swept through the room was but an echo of the despair with which she saw herself brought to this point we will not oblige you to said the coroner with apparent consideration but to those who knew the law against forcing a witness to incriminate herself this was far from an encouraging concession however he now went on with suddenly assumed severity you may answer this was the house dark or light when you entered it and how did you get in the house was dark and i got in through the front door which i found ajar you are more courageous than most women i fear there are few of your sex who could be induced to enter it in broad daylight and under every suitable protection she raised her figure proudly miss tuttle you have heard chloe say that you were in the kitchen of mr jeffrey's house when the grocer boy delivered the candles which had been left by your brother-in-law on the counter of the store where he bought them is this true yes sir it is true did you see those candles no sir you did not see them no sir yet you went over to the table yes sir but i did not meddle with the packages i had really no business with them the coroner surveying her sadly went quickly on as if anxious to terminate this painful examination you have not told us what you did when you heard that pistol shot i ran away as soon as i could move i ran madly from the house where home but it was half past ten when you got home was it it was half past ten when the man came to tell you of your sister's death it may have been your sister is supposed to have died in a few minutes where were you in the interim god knows i do not a wild look was creeping into her face and her figure was swaying but she soon steadied it i have never seen a more admirable presence maintained in the face of a dreadful humiliation perhaps i can help you rejoined the coroner not unkindly were you not in the congressional library looking up at the lunettes and gorgeously painted walls i her eyes opened wide in wondering doubt if i was i did not know it i have no remembrance of it she seemed to lose sight of her present position the cloud under which she rested and even the construction which might be put upon such a forgetfulness at a time confessedly prior to her knowledge of the purpose and effect of the shot from which she had so incontinently fled your condition of mind and that of mr jeffrey seem to have been strangely alike remarked the coroner no no she protested arguing a like source 
no no she cried again this time with positive agony then with an effort which awakened respect for her powers of mind if for nothing else she desperately added i cannot say what was in his heart that night but i know what was in mine dread of that old house to which i had been drawn in spite of myself possibly by the force of the tragedy going on inside it culminating in a delirium of terror which sent me flying in an opposite direction from my home and into places i had been accustomed to visit when my heart was light and untroubled the coroner glanced at the jury who unconsciously shook their heads he shook his too as he returned to the charge another question miss tuttle when you heard a pistol shot sounding from the depth of that dark library what did you think it meant she put her hands over her ears it seemed as if she could not prevent this instinctive expression of recoil at the mention of the death-dealing weapon and in very low tones replied something dreadful something superstitious it was night you remember and at night one has such horrible thoughts yet an hour or two later you declared that the hearth was no lodestone you forgot its horrors and your superstition upon returning to your own house it might be she murmured but if so they soon returned i had reason for my horror if not for my superstition as the event showed the coroner did not attempt to controvert this he was about to launch a final inquiry miss tuttle upon the return of yourself and mr jeffrey to your home after your final visit to the moore house did you have any interview that was without witnesses no did you exchange any words i think we did exchange some words it would only be natural are you willing to state what words she looked dazed and appeared to search her memory i don't think i can she objected but something was said by you and some answer was made by him i believe so cannot you say definitely we did speak in english no in french cannot you translate that french for us pardon me sir it was so long ago my memory fails me is it any better for the second and longer interview between you the next day no sir you cannot give us any phrase or word that was uttered there no is this your final reply on this subject it is she never had been subjected to an interrogation like this before it made her proud soul quiver in revolt notwithstanding the patience with which she had fortified herself with red cheeks and glistening eyes she surveyed the man who had made her suffer so and instantly every other man there suffered with her excepting possibly durbin whose heart was never his strong point but our hearts were moved our reasons were not convinced as was presently shown when with a bow of dismissal the coroner released her and she passed back to her seat simultaneously with her withdrawal the gleam of sensibility left the faces of the jury and the dark and brooding look which had marked their countenances from the beginning returned and returned to stay what would their verdict be there were present two persons who affected to believe that it would be one of suicide occasioned by dementia these were miss tuttle and mr jeffrey who now that the critical period had come 
straightened themselves boldly in their seats and met the glances concentrated upon them with dignity if not with the assurance of complete innocence but from the carefulness with which they avoided each other's eyes and the almost identical expression mirrored upon both faces it was visible to all that they regarded their cause as a common one and that the link which they denied as having existed between them prior to mrs jeffrey's death had in some way been supplied by that very tragedy so that they now unwittingly looked with the same eyes breathed with the same breath and showed themselves responsive to the same fluctuations of hope and fear the celerity with which that jury arrived at its verdict was a shock to us all it had been a quiet body offering but little assistance to the coroner in his questioning but when it fell to these men to act the precision with which they did so was astonishing in a half hour they returned from the room into which they had adjourned and the foreman gave warning that he was prepared to render a verdict mr jeffrey and miss tuttle both clenched their hands then miss tuttle pulled down her veil we find said the solemn foreman that veronica moore jeffrey who on the night of may eleventh was discovered lying dead on the floor of her own unoccupied house in waverley avenue came to her death by means of a bullet shot from a pistol connected to her wrist by a length of white satin ribbon that the first conclusion of suicide is not fully sustained by the facts and that attempt should be made to identify the hand that fired this pistol it was as near an accusation of miss tuttle as was possible without mentioning her name a groan passed through the assemblage and mr jeffrey bounding to his feet showed an inclination to shout aloud in his violent indignation but miss tuttle turning toward him lifted her hand with a commanding gesture and held it so till he sat down again it was both a majestic and an utterly incomprehensible movement on her part giving to the close of these remarkable proceedings a dramatic climax which set all hearts beating and i am bound to say all tongues wagging till the room cleared End of chapter fifteen part two Chapter sixteen of the Filigree Ball by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter sixteen. An egotist of the first water. Had the control of affairs been mine at this moment, I am quite positive that I should have found it difficult to deny those two the short interview which they appeared to crave and which would have been to them such an undeniable comfort but a sterner spirit than mine was in charge and the district attorney into whose hands the affair had now fallen was inexorable miss tuttle was treated with respect with kindness even but she was not allowed any communication with her brother-in-law beyond the formal good afternoon incident upon their separation while he scorning to condemn his lips to any such trite commonplace said nothing at all only looked a haggard inquiry which called forth from her the most exalted look of patience and encouraging love it has ever been my good fortune to witness durbin was standing near and saw this look as plainly as i did but it did not impose on him he said 
but what in the nature of human woe could impose on him durbin is a machine a very reliable and useful machine no doubt yet when all is said a simple contrivance of cogs and wheels while i well i hope that i am something more than that or why was i a changed man towards her from the moment i saw the smile which marked this accused woman's good-bye to francis jeffrey no longer believing in her guilt i went about my business with tumult in brain and heart asking in my remorse for an opportunity to show her some small courtesy whereby to relieve the torture i felt at having helped the coroner in the inquiries which had brought about what looked to me now like a cruel and unwarranted result that it should be given to durbin to hold such surveillance over her as her doubtful position demanded added greatly to my discomfort but i was enabled to keep my lips firmly shut over any expression of secret jealousy or displeasure and this was fortunate as otherwise i might have failed to obtain the chance of aiding her later on in other and deeper matters meanwhile and before any of us had left this room one fact had become apparent mr jeffrey was not going to volunteer any fresh statement in face of the distinct disapproval of his sister-in-law as his eye fell upon the district attorney who had lingered near possibly in the hope of getting something more from this depressed and almost insensible man he made one remark but it was an automatic one calculated to produce but little effect on the discriminating ears of this experienced official i do not believe that my wife was murdered this is what he said it was a wicked verdict my wife killed herself wasn't the pistol found tied to her either from preoccupation or a dazed condition of mind he seemed to forget that miss tuttle had owned to tying on this pistol and that nothing but her word went to prove that this was done before and not after the shot had been delivered in the moore house library i thought i understood him and was certain that i sympathized with his condition but in the ears of those less amiably disposed towards him his statement had lost force and the denial went for little meanwhile a fact which all had noted and commented on had recurred to my mind and caused me to ask a brother officer who was walking out beside me what he thought of mr moore's absence from an inquiry presumably of such importance to all members of his family the fellow laughed and said old dave has lost none of his peculiarities in walking into his fortune this is his day at the cemetery didn't you know that he will let nothing on earth get in the way of his pilgrimage to that spot on the twenty-third of may much less so trivial an occurrence as an inquest over the remains of his nearest relative i felt my gorge rise then a thought struck me and i asked how long the old gentleman kept up his watch from sunrise to sundown the boys say i never saw him there myself my beat lies in an opposite direction i left him and started for rock creek cemetery there were two good hours yet before sundown and i resolved to come upon uncle david at his post it took just one hour and a quarter to get there by the most direct route i could take five minutes more to penetrate the grounds to where a superb vehicle stood drawn by two of the finest horses i had seen in washington for many a long day as i was making my way around this equipage i came upon a plot in a condition of upheaval preparatory to a new sodding and the planting of several choice shrubs 
in the midst of the sand thus exposed a single headstone rose on his knees beside this simple monument i saw the figure of uncle david dressed in his finest clothes and showing in his oddly contorted face the satisfaction of great prosperity battling with the dissatisfaction of knowing that one he had so loved had not lived to share his elevation he was rubbing away the mould from the name which by his own confession was the only one to which his memory clung in sympathy or endearment at his feet lay an open basket in which i detected the remains of what must have been a rather sumptuous cold repast to all appearance he had foregone none of his ancient customs only those customs had taken on elegance with his rise and fortune the carriage and the horses and most of all the imperturbable driver seemed to awaken some awe in the boys they were still in evidence but they clung back sheepishly and eyed the basket of neglected food as if they hoped he would forget to take it away meanwhile the clattering of chains against the harness the pawing of the horses and the low exclamations of the driver caused me the queerest feelings advancing quite unceremoniously upon the watcher by the grave i remarked aloud the setting sun will soon release you mr moore are you going immediately into town he paused in his rubbing which was being done with a very tender hand and as if he really loved the name he was endeavouring to bring into plainer view scowling a little he turned and met me point-blank with a look which had a good deal of inquiry in it i am not usually interrupted here he emphasised except by the boys he added more mildly they sometimes approach too closely but i am used to the imps and scarcely notice them ah there are some of my old friends now well it is time that they knew that a change has taken place in my fortunes hi there hands up and catch this and this and this he shouted but keep quiet about it or next year you will get pennies again and flinging quarters right and left he smiled in such a pompous self-satisfied way at the hurrah and scramble which ensued that it was well worth my journey there just to see this exhibition of combined vanity and good humour now go he vociferated and the urchins black and white flew away flinging up their heels in delight and shouting bully for you uncle david we'll come again next year not for twenty-fives but fifties i will make it dollars if i only live so long he muttered and deigning now to remember the question i had put to him he grandly remarked i am going straight into town can i do anything for you nothing i thought you might like to know what awaits you there the city is greatly stirred up the coroner's jury in the jeffrey moore case has just brought in a verdict to the effect that suicide has not been proved naturally this is equivalent to one of murder ah he ejaculated slightly taken aback for one so invariably impassive and to whom is the guilt of this crime ascribed he presently ventured there was mention of no name but the opprobrium naturally falls on miss tuttle miss tuttle oh since mr jeffrey is proved to have been too far away at the time to have fired that shot while she i am following you was in the very house at the door of that library in fact and heard the pistol discharged if she did not discharge it herself which some believe notably the district attorney you should have been there mr moore he looked surprised at this suggestion 
i never am anywhere but here on the twenty-third of may he declared miss tuttle needed some adviser ah probably you would have been a good one and a welcome one eh i hardly thought he would have been a welcome one but i did not admit the fact nevertheless he seized on the advantage he evidently thought he had gained and added mildly enough or rather without any display of feeling miss tuttle likes me even less than veronica did i do not think she would have accepted certainly she would not have desired my presence in her counsels but of one thing i wish her to be assured her and the world in general any money she may need at this at this unhappy crisis in her life she will find amply supplied she has no claims on me but that makes little difference where the family honour is concerned her mother's husband was my brother the girl shall have all she needs i will write her so he was moving toward his carriage fine turnout he interrogatively remarked i assented with all the surprise with all the wonder even which his sublime egotism seemed to invite it is the best that downie could raise in the time i allotted him when i really finger the money we shall see we shall see his foot was on the carriage step he looked up at the west the sun was almost down but not quite have you any special business with me he asked lingering with what i thought a surprising display of conscientiousness till the last ray of direct sunlight had disappeared i glanced up at the coachman sitting on his box as rigid as any stone you may speak said he cesar neither hears nor sees anything but his horses when he drives me the black did not wink he was as completely at home on the box and as quiet and composed in his service as if he had driven this man for years he understands his duty finished the master but with no outward appearance of pride what have you to say to me i hesitated no longer miss tuttle is supposed to have secretly entered the moore house on the night you summoned us she even says she did i know that you have sworn to having seen no one go into that house but notwithstanding this haven't you some means at your disposal for providing to the police and to the world at large that she never fired that fatal shot public opinion is so cruel she will be ruined whether innocent or guilty unless it can be very plainly shown that she did not enter the library prior to going there with the police and how can you suppose me to be in a position to prove that say that i had sat in my front window all that evening and watched with uninterrupted assiduity the door through which so many are said to have passed between sunset and midnight something which i did not do as i have plainly stated on oath how could you have expected me to see what went on in the black interior of a house whose exterior is barely discernible at night across the street then you cannot aid her i asked with a light bound he leapt into the carriage as he took his seat he politely remarked i should be glad to since though not a moor she is near enough the family to effect its honour but not having even seen her enter the house i cannot testify in any way in regard to her home caesar and drive quickly i do not thrive under these evening damps and leaning back with an inexpressible air of contentment with himself his equipage and the prospect of an indefinite enjoyment of the same the last representative of the great moor family was quietly driven away End of chapter 16